to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Members' mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobile phones on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via live online streaming either on Assembly website or Democracy Live. Agenda item one is apologies. Have we any apologies this afternoon? No. Agenda item two, minutes of the 25th of February 2021, pages 6 to 13 of your pack. Uh, are members content? And I agree that I sign them as being accurate. Yes. All agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial or other interests of register of members' interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Interest at all. Okay, um, agenda item four then is matters arising. Are there any matters arising, members, from the minutes? Okay. Broadcasting, can you please bring in Mr. Kyle Bingham, Northern Ireland Audit mm -hmm. Office, Assembly Support Officer. Mr. Bingham, can you hear and see me okay? Yes, Chair, sure, thank you. Thank you, we can hear you, so thank you very much. And can I ask you to unmute, uh, to mute yourself now that we've heard that your link is established, and then obviously if you have contribution to make, to unmute. So we've now reached agenda item five, and uh, I welcome Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the Comptroller and Auditor General of the Northern Ireland Law Office, and Mr. Rodney Allen, both joining the meeting. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you, Chair. Members, I refer to a copy of a correspondence to the uh, Education Board from Mr. John Walsh, a member of the Board of Governors of St Mary's High School, Brola. I think I hope I pronounced that correctly. Dated the 22nd of February 2021 and 29th of August, oh, sorry, October 2020 in your pack, pages 17 to 21. In his letter of February, Mr Walsh highlights that he's not received response to his original letter of the 29th of October, in which he raises concerns that the Board of Governors had uh, not been given an opportunity to examine and challenge expenditure uh, against advised budgets. As a consequence, the Board of Governors has not had the opportunity to authorise the three-year financial plan for St Mary's High School. He also raises an, an issue regarding the completion of a perimeter fence without approval of the Board of Governors and without approval of the Department of Education. See attached DE letter dated the 27th of October 2020. Uh, members, Mr Walsh has uh, copied his correspondence to the CNAG and the Department of Education. Are you content, members, will you write to Mr Walsh to advise them we have previously brought the matter to the attention of the CNAG and will now refer his letter to the Education Committee for their attention. Agreed? Uh, Mr Donnelly, you to raise the uh, no, We've been following this one up with the Education Authority, and I right. understand there, there's a reply going to Mr Mr Walsh. From the Education Authority? Yes, as, as, so it's, uh, it's taken quite a while, so we're just progress testing that, so that's our understanding. Okay. Well, you, you've heard um, from the Comptroller and other the General that there's a reply going from the EA to Mr Walsh. As far as we're concerned as a committee, um, we should, if there are any further issues, that it should be transferred to the Education Committee. Is that agreed? Great. Okay, thank you. Members, I refer to a submission dated the 24th of February 2021 from Friends of Knock IVA in your pack at pages 22 to 24. This is regarding a campaign against unlawful development of an important heritage site and an incorrectly streamlined application for a wind turbine which is uh, granted plan permission in 2013 with the turbine subsequently built in 2017 adjacent to the summit of Knock Ive. The company responsible for the institution of the wind turbine is also in receipt of rocks since the 26th of February 2018 and has received approximately um, 5985 rocks certificates with, uh, with approximately £299,250. Um, I suggest we forward this letter to the audit committee for comment, sorry, the audit office for comment as it re is relevant to our forthcoming inquiry into generating electricity from renewable energy and that we write back to friends of Knock IVA advising group, group that we will consider their issues within the context of our forthcoming inquiry and thank them for the information. Members agreed? 
Agreed. Thank you very much. I refer to a memo dated the 25th of February 2021 from the Economy Committee in your pack, page 25, regarding PAC's right to primacy. The Economy, Economy Committee uh, note PAC will uh, be undertaking an inquiry uh, regarding the Northern, Northern Audit Office report into the investment in broadband and have asked to be kept updated with this inquiry when it will commence. Uh, are members content to keep the Economy Committee updated? Great. Great. Thank you. Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 26th of February 2021 uh, 20, from Professor Bartholomew in your pack at pages 26 to 27. This is in response to the committee's request for information re the relocation of 800 students um, to McGee College in Londonderry. Members, Professor Bartholomew states that the university's campus development remains on track for the completion in the next academic year and the student occupants at the Belfast cam campus in the academic year 2021-22 will be approximately 15,500 students. The, the professor states that, and I quote, like all autonomous higher education institutions, Ulster University will from time to time make decisions about location of our provi provision. It does uh, so based on a range of factors, including considerations for student experience, subject alignment and complementarity, regional mission, uh, sustainable recruitment and the needs of industry. In this case, the HSC workforce. He's also keen to invite the committee to visit the development and undertake a tour of the site when it's safe to do so. Um, members, I absolutely understand the point that uh, Professor Bartholomew is making. But as a body that receives considerable amount of public money, we reserve the, as a, the, the right as a public accounts committee to ask questions around that money and the allocations of that money. And it's entirely appropriate that we do so. So, yes, he makes the point that they're autonomous, but they still receive a considerable amount of public money, and therefore it is our uh, right. And we will continue to have that right to ask questions from those who do receive a considerable amount of money from the taxpayer. In that context, however, are you... Um, Content to note and to keep in mind a visit to the campus once it's safe to do so. Great. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 26th of February 2021 from Katrina Godfrey, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Infrastructure, in your packet, pages 28. This is a follow up response to the DVA uh, evidence session on the 18th of February 2021 regarding the disposal of 52 lifts and the details of the current membership of the Department's Audit and Risk uh, Assurance Committee, DARAC. Are you content to note, members? Any questions? Okay. Agreed. 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 Members, I refer to correspondence uh, dated the 1st of March 2021 from Peter May, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary at Department of Justice, in your table pack, pages 3 to 9. This is in response to our letter, the 26th of February 2021, uh, requesting clarification on the Department's intentions in relation to the statutory registration scheme and an update on progress of the five recommendations made in the PAC's Managing Legal Aid Report in 2017. This has just been received and will take time to discuss. Can I suggest we defer this to next week's meeting? Are members content and agree? Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, members, we at this stage remain in open session for our evidence session with the Northern, uh, Northern Ireland and United Kingdom Civil Service Commissioners. Broadcasting, can you bring in Mr Stuart Stevenson, TOA? Mr Stevenson, can you see and hear us okay? Yes, Chair, I can see you and hear you. Thank you. And we can hear you. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, so we move on then to Agenda Item 6, uh, which is the inquiry into... <coughs> Capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Evidence session one, uh, Mrs. Deirdre Toner, papers in your pack, pages 31 to 139. Could I ask those members who are not intending to speak if they could mute their, their microphones, please? Um, at this, this stage, I would invite uh, Ms. Toner, the Civil Service Commissioner for Northern Ireland, to join the meeting. Uh, and in attendance, Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General, and Mr. Stuart Stevenson, the TOA, uh, who's joining us remotely. Um, members, regarding our fifth inquiry into capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, we are receiving two evidence sessions this afternoon. The first one is from 
Ms. Deidre Toner, Civil Service Commissioner, Northern Ireland. And the second one from uh, Mr. Ian Walkmore, the Civil Service Commissioner for the United Kingdom. Uh, Ms. Toner will leave after the evidence session is concluded, which will then be followed immediately by Mr. Mr. Walkmore's evidence session. Members, in your pack are the following papers. The Northern, Northern Ireland Audit Office report on capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Uh, in your pack, pages 31 to 132. The NIAO Restricted Issues paper in your pack at 133 to 135. Biographies of um, Mrs. Toner and Mr. Watmore in your pack at 136 and 137. Northern Ireland Office Restricted Suggestion um, paper in your pack at 138 to 139. Correspondence from Sue Gray, the Accounting Officer at the Department of F uh, Finance, dated the 1st of March 2021, in your table pack at pages 11 to 16. The paper is a comparative study of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Commissioners and the United Kingdom Civil Service Commissioners, which focuses on their respective use of exemptions. So, members, we are at uh, session one, uh, and can I take this opportunity to welcome you, uh, Mr. Turner, to uh, PAC this afternoon, and invite you to make an opening statement uh, if you wish to do so, and then if you're kind enough to take some questions from members, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll refer to NICS instead of the Northern Ireland Civil Service throughout this document, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I am Deirdre Toner, Chairperson of the Civil Service Commissioners for Northern Ireland. Thank you for your invitation and the opportunity to address members. In my opening statement, I will propose to concentrate on outlining the role of the Commissioners and their engagement on the Northern Ireland Audit Office report in the expectation that any other issues from the report uh, and the role of the CSE may be addressed by way of questions. So who are the Civil Service Commissioners and what do we do? There are three Civil Service Commissioners, including myself, appointed to serve in Northern Ireland, supported by a small secretariat, presently based at Stormont House here in Belfast. At the outset, may I say that Commissioners are passionate with regard to promoting public confidence in the process of recruitment to the NICS. We believe that in many ways, how the NICS recruits its people influences the manner in which the Civil Service is viewed by those it serves and by those who aspire to work there. Commissioners are clear that recruitment policies and practices which are based upon merit serve to build trust and enhance the reputation of the NICS as a flexible, competent deliverer of public services as an, and an employer of choice. No doubt we can all agree that the essence of the merit principle may be very easily understood. It means the best person for the job, where the person has been selected in a fair and open manner. However, whilst the principle can be easily simply stated, Commissioners strongly believe that one of the ways to promote public confidence in the administration of the NICS is by ensuring that the merit principle is observed by all those involved in the recruitment process. In addition, experience has taught us that the operation of the principle must also be supported by appropriate administration systems designed with merit as the key focus. Of course, it's important to remember that the concept of merit does not come from thin air, and its origin uh, is within the statutory framework which sets out the functions given to commissioners. The legislation can be presently found in the form of the Civil Service Commissioners, Northern Ireland Order 1999. The order provides that the commissioners shall maintain the principle of selection on merit on the basis of fair and open competition. It goes on to lay out the key statutory functions of the commissioners, and that is requiring commissioners to draw up a code setting out how practical effect can be given to the merit principle, prescribing the circumstances where the merit principle should not apply, giving commissioners the authority to audit the recruitment policies and practices followed by the NICS, giving the commissioners the authority to require the publication of certain information in relation to recruitment, and requiring that commissioners should authorise appointments to the senior civil service giving commissioners the jurisdiction to consider appeals under the next Code of Ethics. Members will probably now realise that the duty to maintain the merit principle is achieved largely through the application of the Recruitment Code. The Code applies to all appointments made other than internal transfer or promotion. Compliance with the Code is mandatory and for all involved in the recruitment and selection process. It contains a number of important principles requiring that the appointment process should be fit for purpose, the appointment process should be fair and applied with consistency, and that appointments should be made in an open, accountable and transparent manner. In drawing up their code, commissioners are keen to recognise that whilst the code should protect merit, it should be sufficiently flexible to allow the next to adapt to the requirements of modern business practices. Accordingly, the exceptions provision of the Code reflect a recognition by Commissioners of the challenges faced by departments in seeking to deliver at pace a diverse range of public services. 
They provide a legal basis for these appointments that would not otherwise be available. We are conscious that the circumstances may arise where particular skills or experience, which are urgently required, may not be immediately available within existing resources, and the appointment of someone other than through merit may be justified. Examples include where a department wish to appoint, uh, wish to second a person with expertise in a particular work area from another permanent employer to deliver a time-limited project, or where the NICS may have trouble recruiting someone with the required skills and knowledge to deliver a function and wish to appoint a person of proven distinction to carry out that role or per a person has been selected under a government programme which may, for example, be set up to provide opportunities for people with disabilities. Members should be reassured there are checks and balances and time limits in place with regard to exceptions to merit to ensure that their application is fair and reasonable. Members will also be interested to note that the substantive provisions of the Code set out how Commissioners expect appointments to be made to the Senior Civil Service in terms of issues such as attracting candidates, advertising vacancies, the quality and range of information made available to candidates and the selection and assessment processes used. As I mentioned a few moments ago when describing our statutory duties, Commissioners also have a role in auditing the recruitment policies and practices of the NICS to confirm the Recruitment Code is being observed. Our approach to audit and review is to seek assurances regarding the operation of next recruitment policies and practices and to influence improvements. We enjoy regular structured engagement with NICS HR, which complements the scheduled audit reviews which we conduct. The position is that audits may be carried out in, on any part of the recruitment system, and they may focus on individual departments or cut across departmental boundaries. At the conclusion of an audit, the outcomes and findings are discussed with the NICS and a time frame is agreed for any necessary actions. However, it's important to note that the actual conduct of a recruitment competition remains the responsibility of NICS HR. In fact, there is limited scope for commissioners to interfere with the recruitment methods deployed as long as the method chosen is meritorious. Commissioners also require the NICS to publish information annually on NICS recruitment, including, but not limited to, evidence that adequate systems for recruitment and selection are in place. The scope of the information to be published can range from details of internal monitoring or of appointments made as exceptions to merit, statistics relating to recruitment activity, Section 75 analysis, and actions aimed at advancing diversity, equality of opportunity, and targeting areas of underrepresentation in recruitment. I have already referred to the statutory role of commissioners under Article 6 of the 1999 order. This provides that no appointment shall be made to the senior civil service without the written approval of commissioners. A detailed authorisation process is in place in this regard, which has recently been reviewed to make it more streamlined and ensure efficiency and timeliness. In addition, the Recruitment Code now has been amended to provide commissioners the Commissioner shall chair all external senior civil service recruitment panels. This represents an important opportunity for commissioners to reassure themselves that the Code has been observed in practice. Finally, in terms of the functions, the 1999 order provides that commissioners may consider and determine appeals made to them by a civil servant under the Code of Ethics. The Code of Ethics lays out the civil service values, which are integrity, honesty, objectivity and impartiality. It also prescribes the standards of behaviour which civil servants must comply. The position is that if civil servants consider they are being required to act in a way that conflicts with the code or believe that others are acting in conflict with the code, they may raise these concerns with commissioners. In terms of outreach and the requirement to ensure the effective discharge of their functions, commissioners engage with NICSHR and other organisations on a regular basis. This includes regular contact with our counterparts in the GB Commission and with the Commission for Public Service Appointments in the Republic of Ireland. We have joined with them in pursuit of our shared goals of learning and exchange of best practice. Members will understand that Commissioners are constrained in what they can achieve by the nature of their statutory merit. However, we seek to assist in so far as we can within these constraints, whilst remaining conscious that the NICS operates in an ever-changing environment. This requires that Commissioners strike an appropriate balance between a principle-based approach and the need to be flexible and dynamic when appropriate. And that, that before I comment on the Northern Ireland Audit Office report, it would be remiss of me not to observe that the report was published at a time of crisis in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic and the EU exit. Commissioners acknowledge that these matters have placed unprecedented demands on civil service departments and have inevitably refocused priorities and diverted resources. In preparation for the report, Commissioners met with the representatives of the Northern Ireland Audit Office in November 2019 and discussed their statutory role, stressing that they were primarily, primarily concerned with maintaining the merit principle throughout recruitment to the NICS. They advocated that this objective was best served by appointments being made as a, as a default position through external recruitment and fair and open competition. Commissioners acknowledge that, whilst there may be expertise within the NICS, external recruitment promoted diversity and inclusion while leaving the door open for civil servants to apply. 
Commissioners agree in principle with the recommendations of the report and their underpinning themes as areas which require focus to achieve transformation in the next and to place the right people in the right posts. They concur that strong leadership, governance and a collective commitment is required to deliver the identified need for transformational and cultural change. We recently had the opportunity to discuss the key findings of the report with Interim Hawks and some members of the next board. I would reiterate, however, the Commissioner's priority in statute is to ensure that the merit principle is maintained throughout. Commissioners concur with the assessment of the Northern Ireland Audit Office that the implementation of these recommendations relies not solely on DOF and NEXHR, but all departments play in their collective part in a coordinated and cooperative manner. Without a culture where recruitment and the timely planning for it is adequately prioritised and funded, the recommendations and by extension, there is a risk that the transformation agenda will not be deliverable. Commissioners note that the report's recommendation that the NICS and civil service commissioners should work in partnership, taking account of how other models operate, to explore how they can best support the delivery of the transformation agenda, and changes need to reform the recruitment and selection process through the NICS. Commissioners, in principle, would be pleased to work in partnership with NICS uh, to achieve this goal. Uh, barriers to this may be the limitations of Commissioner's statutory authority, as outlined earlier. I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, the, the committee was surprised to learn that, that um, the Northern Ireland Civil Service Commissioners are appointed by the Secretary of State. Yes. Why are they not appointed by uh, 12 ministers? I think one of, the, one of the big things in terms of the commissioners in Northern Ireland, considering the diversity of the society we come from and, I suppose, uh, the, the, the background history, is that the independence was very, very important. And it's a key issue in terms of where commissioners sit. Um, so th there could be perceived public um, interest in terms of, or public uh, misconception that there isn't a, a degree of independence. So sitting within the Northern Ireland, Audit, Northern Ireland Office is one area where we can, largely with the support of our, um, of our ALB, um, carry on our functions uh, without, I, I would say, political interference or, 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 or perceived political interference. Mm. So that's, a, that's the top line area there. Okay. Uh, the Secretary of State is obviously a politician, and he makes the appointment. Yes, that's true, I suppose, what we're looking at in terms of where we're trying to keep a meritorious process in place in, in, an, in a part of, uh, of the world that, ha that has uh, different equality law, different legislation okay. than other areas, and it's, and it's important that we uphold that. But as commissioners, because we, we are independent and look at that and okay. keep that statutory function safe. Well, on the issue then of merit and independence, how are you, how are you appointed? How, how am I appointed? Yeah. Um, through the public appointments process. Um, so, so and you then apply we apply and you go You apply, and you, yes. And you're interviewed and so You're on. interviewed and then one person for the job or the person most meritorious for the job is recommended uh, and put forward for okay. the position. And I presume the Secretary of State doesn't sit on that panel? The Secretary of State doesn't sit on that panel. So, so who, who does then, if I may ask that? Uh, well, I had uh, the Northern Ireland Office representative, representatives, an independent uh, sector member, uh, somebody from the uh, Equality Commission, and also somebody from the, um, uh, well, it was proposed the Department of Finance, but not at that stage. I, it's a little while ago, so I'm not trying to remember back. For my own appointment, I wasn't. So, so, there, that one. <laughs> so there may well be someone from senior officials from the Northern Ireland Civil Service sitting there on the interview panel? Uh, well, it was the Northern Ireland office uh, at yeah. that stage. It yeah. was the ma major person at that stage. Yes, but did you say it was someone from the Department of Finance, which is obviously a devolved department, was also in the uh, panel? Not on that panel, no. Not on that panel, no. Okay, okay Mr Hillage. Thanks, Thank Chair. You. You're very welcome, dear. Thank you. Then. Um, well, unfortunately, the, re the report is uh, quote, uh, damning and stark that we have before us in relation to, the, to what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate that you're probably you'd be somewhat t t 20 months in post at this stage or yes. so. Two years, yeah, right about that. Uh, the Commissioner's remit to, to support a civil service that is effective and that builds upon its core values to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. How do you, where do you see your art at the minute and in, to in, in, invoke that? Well, what have you been doing or how have you been able to bring civil service into your mind and what do you think should be there in accordance with your remit? Yeah. 
Well, we have, we have, I suppose, very specific limited powers, I suppose, at the minute under the 1999 order. Um, and it was a case of, right, what is our responsibility and what we do in terms of meritorious process and make sure that it's in, in the public facing and in public interest. So we build up relationships, as far as I'm concerned, with a, a range of different departments between NICS and NICS HR, the permanent secretaries. Uh, and there are major stakeholders uh, in this and looking at where our powers can be used to, to make sure that the processes are fair and meritorious and that the best person for the job uh, is, is appointed. Um, so there are a range of different mechanisms that we have and we have an Article 6 process where commissioners are involved in that in chairing the senior competitions. The other external competitions we, we, we monitor as well in terms of what the, was the process fair and from, from the four stage process throughout that. Um, so we, it is Nick's responsibility to, to develop the process. Our job is to make sure that it's a meritorious process and that they apply it in, in a fair and even manner um, and that everybody who can apply for the job and the best person for the job is presented uh, uh, as, as the top candidate. So as far as I as far, and my commissioners are concerned, that, that's the priority in terms of what, what we do. Now, there are other areas that we, uh, we engage with them on a daily, weekly uh, basis with NICS HR, with, with our stakeholders as well, and with the, 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 the permanent secretaries. And there's plenty of opportunities there to actually recommend uh, you know, if, if a policy is being developed or, or looking at... Have you had an opportunity yet to make many recommendations? Well, we, we are asked, business cases are put forward, for, for, for example, for exceptions or secondments or particular skills that are needed. Uh, we would, our, our default position, as I said before, is external recruitment. Um, so why, why would you not have external recruitment as a default mechanism and then internal candidates can apply? So we, we, we recommend and we, on that level and also we, we look at the business cases that are put forward to see is that person, do they need that person uh, as an exemption to merit? Those recommendations challenged or are they taken on board? Are they... uh, well, they're, 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 they were right. They are challenged. Um, um, are what we, what we try and make sure is that this person, you know, is this person, should this person be a permanent employee? Should this person, you know, what, why go this route uh, and look at, at, at challenging that issue, which I think is, I think is fair. Uh, obviously, the other devolved uh, jurisdictions, have you had a chance to uh, converse with them and have a look at what they do and how they would impact upon? Yeah, uh, we do. We work. Um, we work with, as I say, we work with the G with the GB Commission uh, as well. They have a different um, uh, regulatory environment than we have here as well. They also have different scale and scope and different legislation that impacts on what they what they do. Um, so we look at we, we swap uh, uh, skills and abilities in terms of what what works well in each jurisdiction. Each code recruitment code has been developed to, to mirror the, the, the jurisdiction you're in. So in terms of the quality legislation and our diverse community he, here, we, we need to make sure that our code reflects the, the legislation that's in place. Secondly, our staff teams uh, meet uh, and, and swap ideas in terms of what would work and what doesn't, and also challenges in terms of audit issues and complaints, because um, we, we audit uh, as well. So they, we've all very similar functions in lots of ways. So they have their regulatory uh, meritorious process, they have their audit function, they, they look at complaints. We, we look at complaints under the Code of Ethics, uh, which is probably a little bit more specific. Um, so, so there's quite a lot of parallels uh, that are the same. Uh, there's opportunities, I suppose, in, in the future for our statutory uh, functions to, to change. Uh, I suppose what I'd say about that is, um, we've had discussions with the GB Commission, is that I think we need to look at the, at, uh, the civil service as, as a whole in terms of what resources are needed, what leaderships need, what governance is, le is needed, um, and looking at the people's strategy and where, what, how do you resource that and what, what does that look like. And if we had extra statutory powers, that would be fine. But you need resourcing across the whole of the next to be able to, to look at best practice across the world uh, and, and what, what a good civil service looks like. So like in New Zealand, for instance, would sometimes There's be a lot of good examples, good yes. Yes. Best practice yeah. So, I mean, we're not, we're not all, we look, we, we look at the Republic of Ireland, their system is slightly different and maybe mirrors more, uh, slightly different processes. But it's, we do need to look at um, where, uh, where we can build capacity, look at recruitment processes, are they fit for purpose, do they, do they get the best person for the job, look at job roles, look at, uh, you know, what, what, 
what new recruitment practices there are there, and also look at the timeliness in terms of recruitment practices. I know from the report, you know, there's there's criticisms in terms of how long that takes uh, in terms of performance. Uh, as a public service, we have challenges. Every public service has challenges because you've, you know, you haven't got identified money. You have different uh, trade unions, legal requirements. You have um, the panels to set up, and you've also uh, security issues. I know we could say that about every public service, um, but w one thing about public service, they will get challenged on the policy they create and make sure that they're adhered to. So, and there's public perception and trust issues there that some of the private sector, for example, wouldn't have s such barriers. I suppose so. It's a bit uh, of looking or, looking around at all the different practices and see, okay, what would work on a meritorious process and would be fair and fit and fit for purpose. You can have a whole range of areas, but you need to keep that core uh, safety mechanism, that the, especially in, in in this area here in, uh, where we live. How long your appointment for? My appointment is for five years. For five years. Yes. And would you have any priority within the next three years to? Look at them specifically, or yeah, we 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 publish our our, our strategy and our plan. Um, bottom line, when when I took over, there was there were, we were involved in quite a lot of activity that wasn't under our statutory framework as right. such. So, and we have a limited we had a limited team and a limited resources. Um, uh, so you you look at how best you can look at the audit function. You know, creating a safe process uh, within the resources that you have. Um, so I can see, and we could, with our discussions with 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 Nix and the XHR and our and our stakeholders, a whole a whole range of areas that we could get involved in. But unless the statutory area was was changed, it 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 leaves it leaves us with quite a tight remit. Um, so we have had discussions about what that could look like. But again, it's mirrored up to what resources are going to be put in place in the wider context, because we could. We could aim for the sky in different areas, but unless you're you're working in partnership closely, and also the resourcing is there for for the civil service, and they own the process uh, at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, we we need to we need to you need to pick your fights as such yeah. in terms of where you. But you have identified sort of specific areas where, <coughs> through the likes of the report and that, and work that this committee has been doing over a period of time in relation to, for instance, there's a difficulty with contracts. Yes. Uh, whereby obviously contracts are rolling on and on, look out of control, to be honest, and stuff yeah. like that. Where there, there does seem to be some sort of issue with senior management at that level. Yeah. Is there anything specific that you look at? Well, I think you're back to work. For, you're, you're, well, contracts and management and temporary and temporary contracts and agency work and all of those are are symptomatic of where, where's the bigger plan in terms of workforce planning. So one of the big recommendations we've, we, and discussions we've had with, with our stakeholders is where's, where's the plan in place and where's the business plan right. and what's the need and what's the business need. Now that you take that up a level as well in terms of the whole of the organisation. So if you're having to fill posts very, very quickly or you're having to, your contracts are, it's, it, it goes back up the line in terms of where, what, what, what are each department doing? And this is not just a, a, a NICS uh, HR responsibility or Department of Finance responsibility. I think this is across the whole of the organisation. Um, so uh, some of those areas are kind of symptomatic of having to react very, very quickly um, to needs as well as EU exit with COVID-19 and an under-resourced uh, public service at, uh, you know, for these particular issues. And you did, you did mention our furniture in relation to the sizeable chunk of money that goes on agency. Uh, what input do you have on it, the appointment of agency staff? We, do you look at that at all? No, we don't. I mean, we, or? well, uh, well, coming from the different sectors, I mean, agency staff is is it, sometimes you need agency staff for very very quick turnover of of, of particular pieces of work. Um, agency staff will always be more expensive, and it is a, it is a case that needs to be planned into some organisations need agency, some don't. So it's it's. It's a, it's one of a whole range of areas that a toolkit of areas that organisations have. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the it's the best way to to go forward. And, and in terms of sustainability and job, um, being able to grow in a job, it's 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 not part of our uh, remit to 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 comment on that. They have their recruitment practice. We look at the meritorious um, uh, process there. But there does seem to be a problem. There, there's 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 challenges which we would agree with in your in, in your report or, or over a range of areas that could 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 seek investment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir.
Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Deidre, for coming along here this afternoon. Um, just probably two things. Um, you outlined in your opening statement around the, the constraints that you face as a result of the statutory remits um, of the commissioners. Mm -hmm. Can you outline just what, if there's been any proposals been made to change that remit uh, and to enhance the, the, the role of the commissioners? You're asking what I did, or what 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 I would suggest, or what what yeah, thoughts yeah, or are. what comes so far, and what you would suggest. Yeah. Um, well, it. I suppose we 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 would have a desire to 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 look at oh, having uh, an impact on our on a range of different areas. There's no doubt about that. And the GB the GB Commission have uh, another statutory power, which is to extend and carry out functions in relation to the civil service, uh, additional to their legislative powers. So that allows the GB Commission to to recommend and look at training and look at a range of other areas. Uh, that's possibly somewhere where we could go. Um, I think. We, we could say, OK, we want statutory powers right across the range of, 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 of NICS. But bottom line, you're still talking about an under-resourced uh, organisation that we could have X amount of powers, but unless you've got the resourcing and the, the leadership and the governance and the responsibility across all of NICS to deliver on the people's strategy, for example, it, it would leave you sitting with X amount of powers without all of this happening. So there's been quite a lot of blockages for... Uh, for the civil service to be able to get to get things moving, but and uh, but I think that the, the transformation agenda, without the transformation agenda, our powers wouldn't uh, wouldn't 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 work so well, you know. So it, that you need that framework, and you need and also if you've got statutory powers, there is. I mean, carrot and carrot and stick. I mean, there there is an obligation in terms for collaboration, partnership work, and um, a sustained piece of uh, collaborative work across all, all organisations. So, increasing your statutory powers alone will not will not make uh, a safe, uh, uh, efficient, effective service. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Because within the report from the Northern Ireland Audit Office, which the PAC is considering. Yes. Um, in terms of recommendation, 1.3 is there should be absolute clarity on who will oversee the transformation required and it is imperative that this is sufficiently resourced. Now, um, especially over the last year during the pandemic, we've seen amazing work being done by civil service officials in terms of supporting people and businesses and greatly appreciative of that and people have went above, um, above and beyond. But one of the issues is, is that in terms of our recovery, the capacity and capability of civil service is one of the major hindrances to be able to achieve what we need to do in terms of recovering our society, businesses and communities coming out of COVID-19. So this report that we are considering here is having a massive impact upon the day-to-day -day lives of so many people across Northern Ireland. And it's saying here that there should be absolute clarity on who will oversee the transformation required. Mm -hmm. Do you know who's going to oversee it or who's overseeing it at the moment? Because I'm not inspired by who's overseeing it. Okay. Um, well, we know the structure of the civil service at the minute, but I mean, if, you, if this report was published at a time of crisis and COVID and Brexit, uh, and there's unprecedented demands on, on, on the next departments, and they had to refocus their priorities and resources, and, and there were urgent competing demands. Um, so we know the structure uh, of, of the, the senior civil service, um, and there, there, are, there are proposals put forward, and, and I can't really talk about that kind of end of it at the minute. Um, but, you know, commissioners agree in principle with the recommendations, um, but we need to maintain, our role is to maintain the merit principle throughout this. Uh, and planning is key, because it's very hard to monitor performance and manage performance if you haven't got a plan to manage towards. So my, I suppose we support uh, that, you know, the strong leadership, governance, collective commitment, uh, and the, the reliance on all departments to play their role, not just, as I said before, the Department of Finance and NICS HR. Um, and that NICS HR is adequately prioritised within uh, the organisation uh, to be able to, uh, and, and that people's strategy is the top of the agenda. Um, so I think those, 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 once those are in place, uh, I think we, as, a, as an organisation, can, can look at our statutory powers, or in parallel, um, but one can't really happen without the other. It would be ineffective without the other. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Um, the thing is that these issues existed prior to the pandemic. They've been systemic mm -hmm. for a number of years. And I'm sitting here with the impression that the civil service commissioners are part of the problem rather than part of the solution. 
and I, we need and and you know as we're going through this inquiry, I'm not hearing someone and leading on the change who's driving it. Who is it a collaborative effort? You know, I'm hearing that this reports came through. There's recommendations, but I'm not inspired about the work that's been done to implement them. For example, has the commissioners decided to take on some of these recommendations and work towards implementation? I think I've been clear that, the, that with our statutory responsibility at the minute, the civil services have a very tight remit and a meritorious process and make sure that recruitment, we're only one part of, of a, a large organisation or an ALB uh, set aside with independence to look at the recruitment processes and make sure that the system is, is safe and meritorious. And in, in, in lots of parts, there have been very little breaches uh, of, of the processes. Uh, compared to some other areas as well. So uh, I would challenge uh, your, your, your criticism in terms of yourself being part of the problem. Uh, we have a, a small team with a small amount of resources in a time when money is going to get even tighter uh, and, and allocating that to the right people in the right place. Our job is quite focused and you still need a safeguard and a legal background and a safe, safe framework, no matter what uh, transformation agenda there is. You still need that core of the, the, the safeguard in there in terms of what that looks in a, in, a, in, a, in a politically divided part of the world. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I, can I just say before I bring the next um, question in, uh, prior to his retirement, we had the former head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service here in front of the committee, now Sir David Sterling. Uh, one of the things that shocked us as a committee was his uh, the, the authority that he didn't have in terms of uh, the civil service collectively, mm -hmm. uh, we we would assume that the permanent secretaries reported in. He had that had that authority at the top that actually uh, rests and resides with, for example, the head of the civil service in Scotland. Mm -hmm. What's the commissioner's view on that sort of authority uh, and power and responsibility being given to the new head of the civil service in Northern Ireland? I would I wouldn't want to comment on the on the new. Uh, Recruitment. It's a live uh, process at the minute, so I don't, I'm not I don't really to comment want to on go there. I'm simply asking you to comment on that, that responsibility. Uh, well, I, I, uh, that, that, whatever, whatever process is in place, I'm going to take us back to to our remit. Um, this is owned by the civil service. We will examine that and see if it's a meritorious process. And I, I, I'm sorry to keep coming back to that, to that and make sure that it's uh, in terms of the public interest what uh, what would look that would look like. It it, it seems that it's it's an opportunity missed, I suppose, uh, in terms of looking at where people have decision making power uh, to take a transformation agenda forward. Um, but that would be a view, uh, you know, that we you need to look at have people got the. But, but I, with, with respect, I'm not commenting on the individuals. I'm not comment, commenting on their on their respective merits. Okay. I'm comment, commenting on the fact that we have identified uh, prior to this work actually commencing, mm -hmm. we had identified in in in, uh, in, a, in a session uh, last year, early last year, of a problem whereby. And there wasn't that collective responsibility at the top of the civil service by the head of the civil service. He, he did not have that responsibility, which which applies to the head of the civil service in Scotland. If that is not addressed, that will continue, and that will be a problem that will continue in the Northern Ireland civil service, which does not apply in another part of the kingdom, our closest neighbour in Scotland, and something which absolutely needs to be addressed. So if it isn't addressed, it will be an opportunity missed and something which the civil service will continue to suffer from. I think every civil service, especially in the transformation agenda, should look at models around the world and, and those nearest to them as well, and see what what would be appropriate. It's 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 also it's also, you know, in terms of decision making above that as well, in terms of where that what what that looks like and what is fit for fit for purpose as well. Uh, Mr. Beggs. Thank you for your evidence so far, um, and you've said that the role of the commissioners is to monitor and influence improvements in the recruitment process. Um, but we've seen vacancy rates double over this last couple of years, agency rates doubles, and very significant levels of temporary promotions. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for that? I'm going to divide up. We, I, we are not, we're not responsible for, for the recruitment process. OK. The, uh, the civil service are responsible for uh, their, their management and control and the, the procedures they put forward. 
Um, so it, it, it lies with departments and uh, the, the civil service in terms of what processes they adopt and procedures they adopt and under management and control. Our job is to look uh, and make sure that, it's, uh, that the system has, has merit. Um, so you know, we, when we look at exe exemptions uh, under, under our regulations in terms of them coming forward with different areas, but our role is quite tight in terms of what we can, we can do in that. So it's not a case of, um, if you've got a civil service that is under transformation, that has been under, under invested, uh, and a le leadership and governance across that, it's going to be symptomatic of, of the lack of that in, in the structure. I'm grasping to try and understand how the system works with the commissioners, with the civil service board, and then with the permanent secondary. Who is responsible for the mess? Who is responsible for implementing change and getting sensible arrangements so that vacancies can be filled? The responsibility of management and control across next is across the, the teams and in terms of departments and the head of the civil service and the. He's no party, no authority. Okay, but and um, I'm saying each department has responsibility for their for their area of work, and it's not just up to next HR uh, or it or. Uh, ALBs like ourselves to look at that. We're only one part of this where we can ensure what it is that we monitor and make sure we do it well and audit those processes under that remit and then advise um, if there's gaps in, in the audit, advise Nick's HR on what that looks like. So our stakeholder is Nick's HR um, and then I suppose Nick's in general. But the management and control and the decision making across a range of different areas is lies with the civil service. Have you made any Recommendations to next HR, as you've talked about, to improve the system of recent times. We have, we've, we, we have, we get, we get information from them to, to say what they're proposing. For example, as a, a permanent secretary group. Are your recommendations, or can we have a copy forwarded to us so we're aware of your influence? Uh, I, I can, I can send on any any information that we, we can we can give you on that. But the recommendations, I'm taking you back to our, our remit in terms of we, our, we. We have to look at merit and the, the, the best person is there for the job. That is our job and that's the scope of what we do. So we put in processes that way. We're not responsible for the whole broad range of services that are provided by the civil service. That's a, a complex mix of different areas with different resources, with different priorities and different plans in place. You mentioned that you're, you're responsible... Um to try and uh, for, the, for the process, for the merit process, etc., and and that the best person gets appointed. But in many cases, what we've become aware of of the generalists uh, being favoured by the system, and uh, someone with actually a detailed knowledge. The RHI inquiries is a classic example, but mm -hmm. people being put in positions where they didn't have the necessary skills to yeah. carry them out effectively. So uh, how is this being addressed, that, that people with the necessary skills are being put into roles that they really don't have the experience or training to, to carry out effectively? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the job roles is a, is a very good move uh, coming forward in terms of looking at what, what are the big top... There are 24 different uh, occupations across the civil service, and that is, that is the job roles have been very... Uh, in terms of what they need and planning out what big-ticket areas they need to... to to deal with the next uh, five years, ten years. Um, so, th th I I would agree that the generalist area is, is a difficult one. It was it maybe it was sufficient for a particular era, but it we really do need to look at what what each job role could could do. You're talking about top economists, top uh, project managers, all of those areas that probably need investment and tightened up right across the whole organisation. And is this an area you've identified since you've come in, into your role and, and worked on? We have to, we have discussed that with with Nick's HR and they have put pro, fo, forward what they were doing and then we have we, they have crisis areas where, they, where they ha, it hasn't it hasn't happened. You, you've also indicated there's there's, there's uh, you've a limited team there's three um, three commissioners. commissioners. Yes. How many staff is there behind you as well? We have five part time staff. Five part time staff. Okay. And and you've said that you have to chair all external. Senior appointments to this civil service. Grade five and grade five and above, yes. How many many uh, um, appointment processes would that be a year? Do you really need to be involved in every one of them? 
Well, if you're talking about the GB Commission, they're involved in the internal senior appointments as well as the external ones. So there's, there's, you know, that that's another role that they uh, appoint. It it was, uh, yes, we are involved. In it. It, it, it's there was 75 in the last 18 months in external. So it can, it, there are. Um, we chair it to make sure that the process from Grade 5 and above is, is meritorious and that everything from the candidate information booklet right through to the appointment and the four-stage process. And as well, Stage 5 is the appropriate level or, or should it be a higher level or a lower level? Well, it's, it's, it's comparative to the GB uh, area. So grade 5 and above is where you've got substantive leadership um, and, and governance issues in the organisation. Uh, so Grade 5 and above uh, is, 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 is what, what's in the code. And in terms of appointments to the senior civil service, what is the typical period of time that it takes to go through the appointment process? And can you advise the many temporary appointments that are at present? Uh, I can't. I'll get the information to you in terms of the temporary appointments. Uh, I can send that on to, to the committee. Um, the first part, sorry. The length of time that it takes to appoint is the process satisfied. I know in the world of business, you can't afford to wait. No. You need to get the job filled. You need to uh, keep moving forward. So how long does a typical appointment process uh, take? Uh, it, 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 it takes around the three months area. Uh, some, I know in part of the reports it, it has taken longer, but that's, that's in another, another big competition. Um, we, we agree that the, the timeliness of the appointments, uh, but as I said before, comparison to the private sector is maybe not overly fair in terms of there's quite a lot of public money. There's public money involved and you'd be hauled over the cold if you, if you don't uh, go and check all of the different areas. So sometimes the public service has security clearance and we have, a, we have a litigious society so we have to make sure that the panels are appropriate, that the, the representation on the panels are appropriate, that the... That, uh, the you know, the, the testing is appropriate, that the interviews are appropriate to the job, all of that area. Um, so sometimes, I think in the public service, we, 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 they have to be more careful in terms of that. I'm not defending it. I think a, a turn, three month turnaround for a, a senior leadership programme is not, is not unreasonable. Except that a private company is, is subjected to the same. Uh, rigors of the law in terms of, uh, merit of they're, they're, they're subject to the to to, to ma the main equality law uh, and the rigors of the law there, but but in terms of sometimes the budgets are you know not necessarily are waiting on budgets to come through for a particular post, for example, and then the ring if you're talking from the start of the process, money identified for a post, and then looking at um, making sure that the post is uh, whatever part of the public money is used, and then that the, the, the testing, the interviews, the recruitment panel, getting all of that together to make sure that there's a meritorious process. Now, that is, all, that is owned by the civil service, not by ourselves. But I'm asking you about the process. Are you going to be defending a three-month-plus process? No, no, I'm not defending a three-month-plus. When you've got a senior, if, well, somebody will have to give notice as well from an, ex from an external employer and give notice from their own employer internally if they are appointed. So that includes a notice as well. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's not unreasonable at that level. I agree in terms of the report has identified areas. Uh, but that is, a, that is a management and control issue for, for the Northern Ireland Civil Service. And we have advised them in terms of what does that, what would a good practice look like? You accept that if it takes too long, good candidates will be uh, picked up? I understand. Before. Totally accept that, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr O'Toole. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, um, Ms Toner, for coming and giving us evidence today. Um, can I just um, check on a couple of um, uh, basic points? Do you think... Would it be fair to say that your view is that the legislation that governs um, the GB civil service commissioners allows them to take a more strategic role in terms of HR policy? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, they have different. We're, we, they have different legislation that allows them um, to to work across a range of areas. Um, that's not unfeasible here. Uh, but the legislation would need to change, uh, and, and in terms of how we can how we can um, support that support that area um, in a more strategic way. They have they they deal with complaints as well as that on a on a, on a larger audit function, um, and they so th they are a secretariat for a range of areas. So they can they can have a joined up approach to some of the areas as well. Um, so we've got a very tight remit at this stage in terms of the Northern 1999 order, so there would need to be significant change there. 
and do you think, uh, tell me if I'm placing you in an invidious position, would you like to see the commissioners given more legal authority to um, help spearhead change or take a more strategic role? Oh, you, you, yes, you could, but it, it's it, again, have it, it would be right. What are those powers and what are those resources available to do that? Uh, but alongside that, I keep coming back to the point in terms of a transformation agenda and the leadership within NICS would need to be there. Otherwise, we'd be left with statutory powers that we can't. If you're talking about there's different there's different systems in place in the GB. For example, if they're looking at uh, recruitment areas across a range of uh, mechanisms outside of the competence-based process, well then the GB Commission can can go in and look and support that and look at training and look at different areas. Yes, there is there is a role for our, for more functions for ourselves. Um, but it would need to be, we could more commissioners, we could have commissioners working across different areas in terms of looking at equality, looking at, looking at leadership, looking at governance, all of that. But on our role at the minute, it's tight in terms of the, but it'd have to be a meritorious process that we're looking at, and that's the role of a commission to look at that. Do you think then that the NIO um, placed too much of an emphasis on your role, given the legislative limitations you've talked about, because they do mention you in their report in several, uh, at several points, they mentioned you having a, quite a large role from their perspective in driving change. Would you, do you think they overemphasized that? No, I don't. I think, I think the, point, the point was a, a collaboration and partnership and looking at best practice and looking at uh, the commission working together with Next HR or Next HR working with us as well. Uh, there are examples, we, we do work closely with them. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a big organisation with a, with a transformation agenda that hasn't happened. So there's a... Uh, no, I don't, I don't think... I don't think the, we've agreed that the report uh, substantively uh, reflects our views. So I don't, th I don't think... It's, we're mentioned three or four times throughout it, but I, I, it's, we have no opposition to working in partnership or looking at what, what powers may be needed to do both work in partnership and also, uh, you know, uh, a sort of a collaborative way as well. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, you, you, in order to do the kinds of strategic things that the report says directly or at least implies fairly heavily you should be doing, you would need, there would need to be change to the order on which uh, the legislation which you're based. A lot of that's quite process. Can I just sort of take you, dear, you back a little bit on the, the broad picture? Because the picture of the, of the Northern Ireland Civil Service that's painted by the NIAO report is of one that is um structurally extremely flawed uh that it is bluntly speaking too old too generalist uh not high performing uh some of the things came out obviously in the rhi debacle but in addition to that there are uh frankly fairly big fundamental cracks in the edifice of nick's um uh, do you agree that it is fairly fundamentally flawed and needs pretty serious overhaul? Well, I, well I, fundamentally flawed is 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 not. The, I I'd rather be specific in terms of that the organisation yeah. needs strong leadership, governance, collective commitment. Uh, that it needs to uh, departmental responsibility uh, in terms of that transformation agenda, not just sitting with 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 uh, one department, um, and that. Next HR in terms of recruitment and practice, th that area that I can talk about needs uh, needs uh, p the people strategy needs needs legs and it needs resources and it needs uh, you know c c uh, c building up leadership and governance at a range of different levels in the organisation. That's a next responsibility uh, to be able to do that, and we can sit as one part of lots of organisations who can advise them on what that would look like. We're in a fairly unique position in terms of civil service commissioners that we, we can see quite an awful lot of the recruitment issues across the organisation and we know the culture and we know the litigious end of it as well and also the legal aspects. So there's scope for us to, to work with them to, to look and see what that looks like and also to get in early, I suppose, in terms of policy development. Um, you know, now not a finished article, but if policies are being developed in new procedures and new policies, what does that look like in terms of the commissioners maybe being involved in some, in some of those areas to advise? That, 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 I, that's most of what you said is fair enough there, but just if I could just probe a little bit, you've, 
whenever I talked about fundamental flaws, you came back and said that what was needed was strong leadership and then a few other phrases. But surely those are things that would be needed at any point in any organization. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 those are always good prescriptions for organizations. But the reason I pressed you on the fundamental flaws point is that simply that this report seems to indicate fairly significant issues it's, it, it, that need uh, addressing. And one of the issues I suppose it um, would be useful to, to get your view on is, uh, and it's something that's come up in, less in, directly in the NIO report and, and more in other bits of evidence that we've taken, that there's a relative lack of um, uh, inward recruitment to the senior reaches of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. It tends to be quite um, uh, parochial, bluntly. It, it tends to recruit from within, and there, there's a, and there might be an issue with both recruitment uh, to senior posts from uh, for, from external candidates. First of all, do you think there's an issue there? Do you think that senior roles in the Northern Ireland Civil Service are attractive enough to uh, people who either are in the private sector here or elsewhere, or indeed perhaps in jobs in uh, Whitehall or Dublin or Edinburgh? Uh, secondly, do you think there are issues with how attractive this, and it would just be, you know, Tell me if you th I think I'm asking questions out with of your role as a civil service commissioner. Mm -hmm. I'm interested. In, I'm interested in your view anyway. Do you think there's an issue around graduate recruitment because that has again come up as a repeated issue? Those are the two questions. Do you think there's enough? Um, in, do you think there's enough external recruitment, or in, that it's attractive enough to uh, mm -hmm. for good external candidates for roles at grade five and above? And secondly, what are your views on issues around graduate recruitment? Okay, there's quite a lot there. Um, on the grad, well, I would say on the graduate recruitment, it's a bit like the housing market. You need first-time buyers, and you need you need new blood in an organisation. There's no doubt about that. The the, the apprenticeship scheme, the graduate uh, scheme, uh, any anything like that is lifeblood to an organisation. But you've also got middle management and development governance and leadership skills at a, minute, a middle management level. You've got an aging uh, aging workforce. Um, you know, I think 48% are over 50. So you you know, that the planning and workforce planning around that, you're looking at different issues that are, are coming up in terms of EU, Brexit, COVID, all of those areas uh, uh, that they, they need skills and specific skills. There's also the issue of looking outside of the organisation. Um, uh, you know, if you're talking about SIB, for example, or whatever, which is um, where, where specialist skills are um, recruited from, the question is, why aren't they within the civil service? as well, and why, why aren't those specific, specific roles within the organisation there as well. Um, so the, the bottom end of an organisation, the top end of an organisation need investment, but the middle management in, inside do. And there's also all cultural issues in a large organisation with 22, 23,000 employees. But you need to separate what is the organisation in terms of each department's responsibility versus what's a, 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 a HR component, a safe productive HR system will be one where the operational end that or the problem solving end of it is left to the people who are responsible for it and HR is is slick and fit for purpose. Um, I think we've lost all of our members that are joining us remotely at this stage. They seem to be having conversations amongst themselves. Can you hear us at all? No. Yeah. They're all having a good laugh, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's not <laughs> We'll try and re-establish. Getting a message from broadcaster. Sweet. Starleaf Dawn. Beauty, would you like to hear coffee? Yeah. Myself? Yeah. Um, uh, coffee would be lovely, thank you. Would you take it? Uh, just... Um. Oh. Normally do this. <laughs> Or the coffee or the break. <laughs> what she's pushed around, what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's lovely. Thanks very much. Apparently, there was just a bit of an upgrade going on with what? Starleaf. Starleaf was upgrading. No, there's not in here. It's just a. Okay. Starleaf. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, can you hear us? 
the uh, <laughs> it's still being broadcast and they can hear the conversations amongst us, so they can. <laughs> yeah. No, we couldn't actually, but anyway. Um, Mr. O'Toole, can you hear me? No. Yeah. Can anybody who's joining us remotely hear me? I sound like a seance. Okay, um, I think we're going to have to adjourn until we re establish links. We just take oh, a moment to break. Okay. Can you hear me now, Chair? Oh, you can hear me now? Oh, yeah. yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, you, the Mike floor is yours the question again. for a short time. Go. Oh, dear, you're gonna, that, the, sorry, my question was long winded enough. Dearly, I asked you two, two, the two questions to repeat them, uh, hopefully in brief. One, your views on uh, whether there should be more external recruitment to the senior civil service, and number two, um, whether they need an overhaul in terms of uh, graduate recruitment uh, and possibly replacement of what, what the fast train, which was discontinued. Okay, I don't know whether you heard, the, the, obviously you didn't hear the answer, that's fine. Uh, in terms of the external uh, recruitment at senior level, um, I mean, the, the issue, I suppose, is in terms of investment, and the competition in terms of the private sector. So if you've got specialist people that you need in the organisation, there, there's go, you're going to have to look at the top end in terms of what packages look like for uh, for senior staff in that area um, and the, ter the terms and conditions as well. Uh, and you know, so so there's 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 an issue in terms of what people. If you're talking about a uh, grade five uh, applying, it, it could be said that there was a lot of internal people appointed. But it, in actual fact, if you look at that outside the organisation, they're probably getting a lot more in a different package. So there's something about levelling up the playing field. Should that be needed, maybe in partnership with other organisations as well. In terms of, in terms of the graduate end, as I, I had what I'd said was, I think it was a case of it's like the, the the housing market. You need you need you need new blood and new houses, <laughs> first time buyers at the start. So a graduate program, an apprenticeship program, using the exceptions for a range of different different uh, 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 groups to come into the in, uh, change of societal uh, areas at different levels in the organisation. So if there are people with disabilities, people with uh, equality issues that we need to look at, wh where's the diversity in the, in the organisation that we're going to have a, a range of people? There was a recent competition, I think that a third were from external, so that was quite refreshing to see that at a, at a, at a lower level. I think there's a middle management issue as well in terms of looking at what that looks like. And creating governance and leadership there, and what do because we've got, as I said, over 50s, 48% uh, over 50s. So you know that workforce planning, that people strategy is very, very important in terms of what that looks like, uh, and planning that, and not just having to react through temporary employment or or contracts uh, that overextended or whatever. So they're all symptomatic of solid planning that's needed uh, across department level and business cases and and the job roles specific to those areas. Well, they're, they're fairly profound issues. The, I mean, the, the question about age is a not to the, the dispute the hard work, particularly the, the, this past year. Take, I'm taking my civil servants. They're fairly dramatic. Can I ask one final question, Chair? Which is, and you, dear, you can say whether you think this is outside your remit. Well, I, I suspect you will say it's outside, outside right. your remit. But one stark piece of information is that uh, the is the civil servants here are marked on two boxes satisfactory or unsatisfactory, which seems extraordinary. Uh, are you aware of this? Is that something civil service commissioners look at? I know that's, it's not about recruitment, it's about performance management, but um, it doesn't seem conducive to a modern or um, uh, well-run workforce to have two boxes. It is outside of, our remit, but I would, I would agree the two boxes don't, look, don't make a performance appraisal. Um, and performance, um, to, in order to manage performance, you need plans and you need targets and you need indicators that, that areas are working. So uh, a performance appraisal must take account of an awful lot of that as an individual and as a department, as an organisation. Um, so it, it, but it is outside, outside our remit, uh, I'm afraid. But. Uh, if, that's my comment. If I could really one real one final brief one, chair, I'll, I'll squeeze in really quickly. Is has the from your perspective in terms of since this report was published, has the has the lack of having a a hawks in place um, been a problem in terms of getting uh, getting uh, action agreed or a, a reform program agreed? 
I think there's a whole there's a whole range of areas, not just uh, hawks, and we've interim hawks at the minute. Um, but this is the matter for the civil service. So we've interim hawks who are taking uh, parts of the agenda forward. Um, so I'll, I'll have to kind of leave that there at this stage. But there's a range of areas that have brought us to this situation, not just whether interim or hawks. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay. You. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, uh, a couple of points. Did you, would you say um, the voluntary exit scheme has caused some of the major problems we're having now within the system? Uh, it's clearly outlined in the audit report. Would you have an opinion on that? I could have an opinion on voluntary exit schemes generally. I mean, voluntary exit schemes in terms of planning, um, it, it, it's hard to determine who, go, who goes and who puts themselves in the mix. So where, where's the, where are the areas that we need specialist um, uh, roles and do we need to lose people there or do we need to gain people in other areas um, so it's it's not part of, of, of my remit but a voluntary exit scheme is it's, it's fairly global uh, and in, in its approach it's like putting 7% cuts across everything uh, you know it's you, you have to look at the impact of it and more, more plans and more people plans and workforce planning is essential uh, in a big organisation like this voluntary exit schemes sometimes can can leave you without the right people and organisational memory can, can go. And, and, and that's a comment in voluntary exit schemes generally. So, and I asked in the context of the, the report is out, you know, it's a pretty dominant report. So mm -hmm. if you look at it, that, you know, it's okay putting in a grade five and that's your responsibility and above. Mm -hmm. But if the baseline isn't right, it doesn't matter who you put in. So I asked in that context, um, do, do you feel the system's working or it's not working at the minute? Or are you using it? The, the system has a lot of gaps, um, and voluntary exit schemes are, are need to be well thought out in terms of how they do. But this, that, that's that's an ex an ex management and control issue at the minute, and not a, not a civil service commissioner's uh, remit or responsibility at this stage. I can't I can comment, but it's it's not within our remit. No, no, appreciate it, but but your remit is is to put people in place. So what I'm saying is, you have to have an overall view or look at who you're putting in and how they're going to address the problems that lie within the system. Is that a fair comment? It's a fair comment. We're part of chairing the, the, pro uh, the process and making sure that Grade 5 and above is a meritorious and that the best person for the job in that recruitment process is there. Um, okay. No, no, I mean, I, I see it all as one big problem. I mean, I, I no, from the very start, I think the workforce model is not correct and I appreciate your role. I mean, it's just there has to be some wider thinking and in terms of everybody's responsibility within all of that. Uh, just in terms of um, the report itself, obviously the competitions, the time it takes and the, the focus on skills, would you say your role holds any of that up, that process up in terms of recruitment? Uh, when we have an art, what's called an Article 6 process, which, um, and it's, it, the recruitment process belongs to the civil service. So whatever recruitment process they put in place, we make sure in terms of the commission and the small team we have that, the, that it is meritorious. So uh, recently, uh, in my term of office, I've taken it to, to the point where we, we sign it off very, very quickly because there, there were delays in the system, not necessarily with the civil service commissions. We have a two-day and a one-day turnaround as soon as uh, paperwork hits our desk um, and we have we've a commitment to that. So that's one part of the process. Um, but in saying that, if the commissioner's in the room, uh, to me it made sense that the commissioner signed off uh, on that part of the process so that, so that it could be uh, a, a slicker process uh, um, and no less meritorious uh, or no less well governed uh, than that. So that's, that's a new process that came in from, from September for, under my um, watch at this stage. Is, is your role in any way uh, an ombudsman? type role in any way in terms of audit or anything else, no? In terms of, sorry? In the ombudsman's role, you know, in, in terms of looking at other organisations. It's, it's no, it's, 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 very, it's very tightly tied in, in the 1999 legislation. So it's on the 1999 order under the, under the Good Friday Agreement. It's very tight in terms of what our role is and civil service commissioners. Even the GB, it's quite tight in terms of that. No, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be reflecting the ombudsman's role. Okay, just a final question then in terms of any barriers in working with the NICS? Hey, can you outline any barriers? 
Um, it's a, well, well, next in terms of uh, next HR, and they're our biggest stakeholder at this stage, um, you know, or, or anywhere. Um, uh, I, I think there's. I think there's 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 a lot happening in terms of under uh, under investment and a lot of uh, jobs that kind of have to be done because of COVID Brexit. I think there had to be a lot of resources deployed. Um, I can see their frustrations and trying to get business as usual done, yet trying to reform what they're doing. We do meet them as much as we uh, as we can, and we, uh, as I said, weekly, monthly, and engagement meetings across the permanent secretaries and also their senior team uh, members in terms of. Uh, advising or they're seeking advice in, in different areas. Um, as far as that's concerned, I, 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 there, we don't see a barrier as, as such. I see an organisation that needs transformation and change, um, and it need, uh, it, some of the things in terms of, ex so for example, external recruitment, we would like to see an awful lot more of that. Um, and I think um, sometimes there's practices and procedures that don't see the benefit in that. So around those those sort of areas, there, we're, we're happy to look at all different types of programmes and what they would look like and look at it in a meritorious process. Would that work? And there are a whole range of different ways of recruitment practices uh, and uh, across the world that can, that can be used that would be meritorious and fit for purpose. You know, it would be good to see a lot of that uh, uh, brought, into, uh, brought into play. Just finally, Chair, because uh, Deirdre keeps coming back to the resources issue. I mean, clearly there was problems within the system and then you had the VES, the voluntary exit system. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem to have recovered. Is that a fair assessment? You, like you keep coming back to resources, did you? But clearly, there's been a lot of problems for a number of years, and the VES didn't help. Yeah. But it, it <laughs> well, he hasn't recovered the position yet. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to say resources. I mean resources, not just in money, but in in well, training well, and leading and capability in terms of what are the skills we need at, at the start, middle and top of the organisation to be able to create a sustainable uh, civil services fit for purpose for, for, the, for the areas we need to look at now uh, and the emerging areas that, I mean, we're, we're only at the start of this challenging phase, I think, and, and yet the organisation needs to look at the roles that they're developing are the fit for purpose. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a whole range of things in terms of resources being what what skills people have as well, not just the financial end of it, and the willingness uh, to work to work across departments departments to be able to make this happen, and the responsibility sitting uh, uh, within within that area. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. McHugh. Okay, Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fighter uh, Ulfa, uh, Deirdre. Uh, Dean, uh, you're very welcome here to the yeah. or there rather. Uh, I'm 100 miles or more away from you here, uh, but just again on the resources there. That I know that earlier on, if maybe you were alluding to resources in terms of the transformation of change and the likes of it, you, you effectively were alluding to sort of financial resources at one stage. Uh, and I, I intended to ask just the question that, you know, where should that funding go? Uh, are we talking here with the commissioner? Are we talking here then about, we'll say, uh, within the civil service itself? And is there a danger, you know, it ends up sort of in silos, even within the civil service? Oh, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of the civil service uh, itself, um, because as I said, we could we could be given resources in terms of extra reach or whatever. But if you if 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 the organisation you're working with and trying to improve hasn't got a level of investment at various levels, as I said, between money and capability and capacity and skills and, and uh, skilled areas, um, well, then you're not going to be able to. So it's not just, it's money in the right places, money in terms of leadership development, looking at all the areas. I mean, if you're looking at the symptoms in terms of lack of planning, in terms of the, the shorter term contracts, all of those areas, what is it that's making that happen? But th this is this is an ex- uh, uh, Problem. I can only I, I, I can agree that we can see this from the outside looking in. We can agree that those issues are there, but they need they need prioritisation across the departments in terms of each of the each of those areas looking and seeing what their responsibility is and being able to allocate resources in those areas. One department might need more than the other. Um, you know, Nick's HR, for example, to me should be higher priority. If you've got nearly twenty three thousand staff, why have there's there's resources needed there to actually uh, equip the system? 
um, to be able to have a, a to, to have a, an appropriate uh, function. Well, effectively, that is sort of the point that, that I was attempting to get at here in terms of saying uh, next HR and or. Uh, other areas that uh, can be targeted uh, in order to ensure that the resources are deployed in a way that for my they're going to be effective. Sorry, what was the what was the question there? Uh, I, I, Sorry, or were you just agreeing yeah. with me? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm actually agreeing with you at the same time too. But uh, uh, you mentioned in terms of we'll say leadership, but we'll say next HR. Uh, but are there any other areas then within uh, we'll say the various departments of the civil service itself that you think that it should be targeted? Well, without stepping on the toes of permanent secretaries in terms of what, what, they're, what they're doing, I mean, you should be looking at best practice, I suppose, around the world uh, in terms of what, yeah. a, what a modern workforce fit for the challenges that are ahead are, should be looking at. Now, that in one department, it might mean going in at one level. In another department, it might mean uh, leadership change or, or more young people. It depends on each department. I am not in charge of that bit, you know, or, or should be. So I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a whole range of areas that need addressed uh, and not, not undoable. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned that uh, you maintain relationships, not to say with next, uh, next HR, permanent secretary, and someone else as well, too. I just didn't get it at the time. Okay. Uh, and that um, you do that in order to ensure that the whole process, we'll say, that when it comes to recruitment, the likes of it as well, too, is fair. Uh, and... Um, I wonder then that in the event of you challenging, how enforceable is that? If I challenge that process, if, if I feel that something's unfair. Yeah. How enforceable is it? Well, our legislation, if we, if we, we we've got a four stage process um, and if, if, it, if, if we feel that this process is not meritorious, we, we can stop that part of the process under our legislation. So there is, there Three, are, there are points in the recruitment process where we can say, listen, from, right from the very, so we're involved even at the very, very start of the recruitment process in terms of what a candidate information booklet looked like. So you're, you're there yeah. with that hat on you in that room to look at that and say, right, okay, is this fair? Is this getting the right skills for the job? Is it, um, it you know, is it, is it, is it, is it going to be? Is it going to be look weighted towards one or the other, or or one person or one field or the other? So you're, you're, you can get a sense in the room from that process, and then as the four stages go through, you're able to see what what the whole process is, uh, what the skills and abilities. And if we if we feel that there is something that's not quite right or whatever, then in terms of anything from panel right through, we, we can stop the process, yes, and then try and solve it with them as well in terms of what that looks like and why it has occurred. Yeah. Okay, that's grand, Cornel Robert. Thank you. Uh, that was exactly just what I wanted to do a bit of clarity on because I wasn't that sure just how enforceable or how, uh, to what extent you had authority there. You know. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harvey, thank you very thank much, you. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Um, Toner. Thank you. What do you consider the most important aspects of your role and responsibilities? Okay. Um, the most important part is to uh, it's, it's public confidence and the merit and the merit process to make sure that wh whatever process Nix um, adopts in terms of the recruitment practices, that everybody who can apply to that has an equal chance of getting to the best person for the job. So it's the best person in the best place in, in the job, and that's in, in essence what we're what we're trying to do. It's 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 sort of fair play in terms of we're there as the legal end of that whole range of services that are available, that, that that makes sense to us and making sure that the processes are that we can examine that. Then we develop the code on the basis of that tied up to next recruitment processes and their manual or whatever. So that informs. Uh, so our code will try and as far as possible make sure that this, their systems are the, what they're what we're looking at are meritorious. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Can I just re return, if you don't mind, uh, to the leadership of the organisation, the, the Northern Ireland Civil Service? In terms of the lines of accountability between yourselves uh, and, and the civil service, are you convinced that the appropriate power and authority is there uh, to, to ensure that the civil service is properly 
uh, scrutinised? Um, as I said, that's that's a that's a a personal view. Commissioner's role is very 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 specific. Um, so whatever the whatever processes, and it's very very tight remit. Um, so whatever processes are put forward to us, our job is to. To, within our regulatory role uh, is, is to actually look and see whether that is meritorious. So it's a very, very tight process. Our job is not to comment on, on, on whether uh, a, a civil service position is fit for purpose at, at that stage, only if it's in the recruitment process. Um, do, I'm, do you have the I'd, power I'd, and authority, in, for example, in terms of uh, legislation to develop your role or responsibilities? Uh, or is it very tight, uh, and do you feel hamstrung in that context? Then it's very, very it is it, it is tight. Uh, there are opportunities uh, for a, a commission to with with more resources um, and and with a broader base of commissioners, as opposed okay, to look at different right. areas. So, so you have and other members made reference. You have made reference to resource a number of times. I think there are three of you, and you have five part-time staff. Are you saying when you continually refer to resource that you don't have enough resource to carry? When I continue, res I, when I'm talking about resources in the main, it's to do with the civil service, right? Uh, because it's if you don't have, there's a, there's a range of different areas in your your capacity and capability report. There are wide ranging areas. Um, there's 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 twofold here. There's that resource area that needs invested in for the transformation agenda. Um, Putting resources in us without that happening is going to leave us without a, a, an imbalance. Mm. Yeah, but when you, can you say see that in, in the main, okay. So most of the time you're referring to the civil service. What I'm asking you is, you're have you enough resource for the three of you who are commissioners, with your for, your part, five part-time staff, to carry out the functions you've been appointed to do? The functions we have, as it stands at the minute, we have enough resources to do that, and in terms of statute. Okay. Um, in terms of the the. Uh, and this is a question we can put to Mr. Watmore as well. But in terms of the commissioners in the, in the mainland, I mean, mm -hmm. do they do they work at Westminster? When you talk about the, the G GB commissioners, mm -hmm. do they work at Westminster, the Welsh Assembly, the Scottish Parliament, and the London Assembly, or, or are they are they are they one body that will go in, in terms of the civil services that are required there? Can you repeat that? What I mean is, you are specific. For the for Northern Ireland yes. and the Northern Ireland Civil Service, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in terms of the Imperial Civil Service, the Scottish Civil Service, or whatever, how does the how does the Commission work on the mainland? They cover Scotland and uh, Wales, um, so and they are tied to the Cabinet Office. Right, uh, we're an arms length body of the Northern Ireland Office, but, but not England, not 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 Westminster, not the London Assembly. Just Scotland and Wales, you say? Scotland, saying? Wales and England, yes. They, oh, they are covering yeah, yeah, England? Yeah, the GB, yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the, the um, Northern Ireland Civil Service and in terms of HR, I think they have something like 350 staff employed in HR and the civil service, plus there are other specialised services bought in. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, do, you, do you not believe that's enough? You can have numbers in an organisation, but you need to look at what the, the roles and, and, and scope of, and capacity and capability within an organisation is. I think when there was set, there set there, and Nick's HR was centralised during uh, reform of, of parts of the civil service. So, um, and then you've got uh, a people strategy that was was put on top of that in terms of what, and then a, a series of blockages for that um, uh, to be put in place. So I wouldn't. Numbers don't necessarily mean that that this. The, the level of people that you need or the skill base is there. I don't. Uh, <clears throat> I think in organisations you sometimes have the HR hoovering up an awful lot of decisions that are actually belonging to, uh, you know, the operations of the organisation, and a and a HR department should be appropriately using the resources to be able to uh, to develop a, a, mm. a, a slick HR function. I mean, I, I'm just wondering in terms of in terms of a business. Um, you know, if you have 350 people employed in, in, in HR and then you have to buy in extra services, uh, there's clearly uh, an issue. And I think one of the things that, a line of questioning we took when the head of HR and the permanent secretary were in front of this committee was, why are you not bringing more people in permanently then mm -hmm. into HR as opposed to buying in 
additional services from the private sector, which surely would be much more cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, and, and yeah, well, agree, local yeah. government or regional government here, uh, there is a, a culture of simply buying in services or, and as Mr. Hilly's referred to earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean that's mm -hmm. value for money. Uh, in many cases, it is not. It's the reverse. But also um, agency workers that are, that are not cost effective yeah. and necessarily do not bring the, the level of requirements in terms of skill, knowledge or expertise that are required. Yeah. Well, it's, it, HR is one area of the civil service where the same thing is happening a, across other areas as well. So um, yeah. I, I would agree that it, it's better to have organisational memory and skills and ability in an organisation. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to return to the head of the civil service because this is something which we have identified as a huge problem, I think, in the civil service. And I know we have a, an acting head of civil service at the moment, and um, I don't, and I will not uh, lead you into the area of re the recruitment. I simply make the point again that um, the it, we we find it incredible that the powers did not reside with the head of the civil service when they bring together all the permanent secretaries at, a, at the board level or whatever, that, that, that power resides as, as it should do. Uh, you have talked in your answer to some questions to members about strong leadership and about culture. Mm -hmm. We are concerned that there isn't that strong leadership because that void is there, and we're also concerned about a culture as well. Okay. And, and I would just simply make that point. But if I, during this, this mandate, which comes to the end next year, during the five years of this mandate, three of those years will have been during suspension of these institutions, mm -hmm. where there was enormous power with the head of the civil service for three years. Mm -hmm. And that head of the civil service did not have the power during those three years to, to carry out a function of government that we as assembly members would have thought, the general public would have thought, would have had that power. That cannot be allowed to happen again. And when these... The, this report is concluded. When we are, this review is completed, mm -hmm. that anomaly needs to be addressed. That simply cannot uh, continue and is not acceptable. That I think that would be the view of this committee, yeah. in, in, in terms of evidence that we've, we, we, okay. we've taken before and positions that members have taken. Um, I'm not aware of any other member at this stage who's any other questions. Okay. So at this stage. I'll ask Mr Donnelly or Mr Stevenson if there's anything they want to ask or points they want to make. Uh, no, no points at this. Okay. Mr Stevenson? No points there is. Chair, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Can I thank you very much for your time and your, your candour uh, this afternoon? It's very much appreciated uh, and uh, good afternoon. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Okay, can I ask broadcasting at this stage if they could bring in Mr Ian Watmore, Civil Service Commissioner for the United Kingdom. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon, Mr Watmore. Um, we can hear you loud and clear. Um, very oh, welcome good. to, to uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly Public Accounts Committee this afternoon. Uh, and uh, in, in a moment, I'll just ask you to make a short presentation and then, if you'd be so kind, answer questions. So, members, I'll just move on then to uh, agenda item seven, which is the inquiry into capability, sorry, capacity and capability in Northern Ireland Civil Service. Evidence session two with Mr. Ian Watmore. Papers are in your pack, pages 31 to 139. And at this stage, I invite Mr. Watmore, Civil, uh, Civil Service Commissioner UK, to join the meeting. Uh, and in attendance, Mr. Watmore, so you know, Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General uh, of the Northern Ireland Audit Office, um, Mr. Rodney Allen, the Director of the Northern Ireland Audit Office, and Mr. Stuart Stevenson of the TOA, who, are, who is joining the meeting remotely. Um, members, the papers for Mr. Watmore's session are on your pack, pages 31 to 139. Uh, and I'm at this stage, uh, I would ask Mr. Watmore if he would like to make a, um, an opening statement to the PAC. Uh, and then I will open up the session to two questions from committee members. Good afternoon, Mr. Watmore. The floor is yours. Very good. Thank you very much, everybody. I um, hope you're well this afternoon. Um, so uh, I won't keep you very long with opening remarks, but just to say my job as the first civil service commissioner was established back in 1855 when the old Northcote Trevelyan uh, civil service principles were established. In that period, 
they judged the civil service of the day to be a mixture of incompetent and nepotistic, <laughs> and uh, they established their new, uh, the so-called Northcote Tra Trevelyan principles uh, for uh, open, fair, meritocratic recruitment, professionalization of the civil service, etc. And in order to make that happen, they established the Civil Service Commission. And my uh, predecessor, but 24, I think, uh, started in 1855. And so I think I'm the 25th person to hold this job. And I have been holding it for nearly five years. We, these days, we have a five-year fixed term. And my term is up in September. So I'm sort of four and a half years through my five years. Um, the uh, principles of the Civil Service Commission for m over a century, and well, 150 years really, were uh, done by custom and practice, but they were finally put into the legal statute position in 2010 under the Constitutional Reform and Government Act, Governance Act, CRAG as it's known, um, which was almost the last act, cross-party act, of the Gordon Brown government uh, before the 2010 election. And, um, and that's the basis on which we operate today. And the Commission is established in that Act of Parliament, uh, has a variety of roles, responsibilities, methods of recruitment and all the rest of it. But principally, when it comes down to it, it, uh, it exists to oversee two things. One is recruitment in the civil service. Um, and the second is the code of behavior that the civil servants operate to once they are inside the system. Um, by far and away, the volume of work is associated with recruitment, but, but it's equally important that we uh, address the code. Um, when it comes down to recruitment, the, uh, the civil service that we cover, and I heard the question towards the end there that you asked of Deirdre, um, is basically the whole of the civil service in uh, England, Scotland and Wales. So that's all the big Whitehall departments, um, Home Office, Treasury, that sort of thing, plus um, the uh, Scottish Government and the Welsh uh, uh, Government uh, civil service teams, and that's what we cover. Um, uh, it's about, it varies, but it's about 420,000 people, and in a given year, um, average recruitment into the civil service is about 10%, so 40,000-ish. Um, in a peak year, I think it's been up nearer 60,000, but normally, if we assume it's 40,000 for the purposes of this conversation, um, uh, that's what we are gambling. And we need to assure ourselves that uh, those 40,000 people are recruited into the civil service openly, fairly, and on merit. And we do that by laying down recruitment principles, uh, which are published document. Um, you can read at your uh, leisure. Um, and those recruitment principles are then devolved for the vast majority of that 40,000 uh, recruitment to departments. Um, departments then do their own recruitment uh, against those principles, and we audit them on an annual basis and um, mark them uh, in our annual report as to whether they've been compliant, noting breaches and that sort of thing. When we get to the very senior end of that spectrum, um, and for senior here, we are talking about people in the civil service grade, permanent secretary at the top, deputy general, uh, um, director general, uh, uh, the old deputy secretary job next down, and directors, which is the third tier of civil service. We are talking about all permanent secretaries, all director generals, and the director cadre that is recruited in from the outside as opposed to is already in the system. Um, it uh, probably ranges from about 150 to 200 appointments a year in that group. And the Civil Service Commission directly chairs the panels for those 200 people. I'll call it 200 in round figures. Um, and I personally chair nearly all the panels relating to permanent secretary grade. Um, and the other 100, which is, which is 10 to 15 a year, and the rest are then spread amongst my team of commissioners. Um, and uh, so the difference, I, I only mark that they're, they're all operating to the same recruitment principles. It's just that when it gets to the most senior end of the spectrum, we directly chair the panels. When it's below that level, or, or, or in the case of directors within the system itself, departments do the recruitment for themselves and appointments for themselves, 
and we audit them uh, on a select sample basis. Um, when it goes to the civil service code, the code is uh, has some uh, elements of it that have to be there under the terms of the Act, um, uh, things like impartiality, objectivity, that sort of thing. Um, the code is actually written by the Cabinet Office, but uh, it has to have those elements in. And we operate as a court of last resort, if you like, against people adhering to that code. So if somebody in the civil service is deemed to have broken the code and is challenged on it, there is an initial investigation within the department, and then whatever the department finds can be challenged to us, if you like, as a court of appeal. And um, very, very occasionally, uh, we uncover something quite nasty and, um, and, and you know, uh, I could, we have one or two examples of those. But the vast majority of time, uh, we, uh, we uh, find that the code has either not been broken or if it had been broken, it was inadvertent and, and not malicious. So um, uh, we, we, we feel good at the end of the year generally that recruitment is adhering to our recruitment principles and that the code is being upheld. <laughs> And this is incredibly important to uh, the integrity and partiality of the civil service going forward and its professionalization and its ability to serve the public. When I came in four and a half years ago, this would be my last opening remarks, um, I took all of that as read, took, you know, took the advice of my predecessor. I'd already been in the system and as in the private sector. So I had sort of both sides of the uh, coin, if you like, in my own experience. But uh, I, with my fellow commissioners, judged that we should have some specific priorities for our five years in office. And we chose the following four, which are three of which I think are timeless. The first was whatever the big projects of the day are in the civil service, you have to sometimes take a slightly different approach. At the time we were coming in, the whole Brexit thing was was uh, from a negotiation and, 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 and we just had the referendum, so there was a lot of moving parts around the system to deal with then. More recently, that, that would be COVID. So some there's, there's nearly always a big thing happening of the day, which you have to be uh, flexible around. But the three that I think are timeless um, are diversity, and by diversity I mean all aspects of diversity, gender, ethnicity, um, uh, you know, social mobility, etc, etc. Um, so that was our first big theme, diversity. Second was what we called 21st century skills, the sorts of things that a civil service usually buys in. And I, I, I heard a little bit about that at the end, where, where often buys in from the marketplace at quite a high rate when it could buy in recruiting or develop for itself. Things like IT, digital, commercial, that sort of thing. So how can we enable more good people to come into the system um, with those skills? And the third area that I'm personally particularly proud of is what we call our Life Chances Programme, which was designed primarily uh, uh, to mean make the civil service truly representative of the society it serves but also to give people uh, a, a chance in a, who come from a difficult background um, usually supported by government policy so we picked three co cohorts of that to start with the first were people who were in prison who uh, as we all know of offending rates um, massively impacted by chances of getting a job and very hard to do when you're when you're an ex-offender. We started to recruit people direct from prison into the civil service. The second was um, uh, military veterans, people by which I don't mean four-star generals, I mean people coming back from Iraq and places like that, who, as we all know, um, often struggle to assimilate back into society and end up homeless and in difficult uh, life experiences. Um, and the third was care leavers, people brought up largely in care, difficult backgrounds, struggling to get work, and we, we were providing avenues of employment for these three groups. And um, over that period, uh, I would say we've been very successful on all those fronts. We've enabled the resource movements for Brexit and COVID without threatening our core principles. Um, we've greatly significantly improved certain aspects of diversity, particularly gender, 
where we peaked recently at 18 female permanent secretaries out of 40, so very close to 50-50, 18 being at least four or five more than I think the, the previous record. Um, we still struggle at the top level with uh, ethnicity, but we're making progress uh, further down the grades, so that hope, there's hope for the future there. So diversity, I think we've done uh, well on. There's always a lot more to do. On the skills, I think we've been uh, successful in recruiting a lot of good commercial people. The, the Crown Commercial Service has got some fabulous people. Um, we've, we've got a lot of very high-end digital capability in the system now. Um, so lots and lots of uh, success there. And the Life Chances one is just a program that's gang gangbusters, really. I mean, we've, we've now got, I think we're possibly the second biggest employer of ex-offenders outside of Timpsons, the well-known uh, employer in, in, in the mainland. Um, we've got veterans from the military starting to join in numbers. And I had the privilege of standing in, the, in a room full of 100 care, care leavers about a year ago um, and just seeing the the passion and the enthusiasm for the for the people to, to join the, the service uh, was was just immense. So um, uh, that's really my remarks. We started a long time ago. We were put under legal framework in 2010. We spend most of our focus on recruitment, where we are a direct manager of the most senior recruitments and an overseer of the broader recruitments. We push particular priorities that meet the uh, issues of the day. And when people are in the system, we oversee their civil service code um, to make sure that people continue to behave with an impartiality and all the other key things. Um, I think it works well. I think uh, civil service uh, continues to be ranked uh, in the last OECD survey that I saw as the number one in the world. Um, and um, that is mainly due to the excellence of the civil servants. But I think a key component is is Northcote, Trevelyan, and Crag, and, and our role within that as uh, enablers of, of, a, of a modern professional service. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll now open the floor to questions from members. Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair. And good to see you, Mr. Watmore. Very welcome. Thank you. We're, you were talking uh, more about recruitment there, but you did mention behavioural. I was just wondering how many behavioural problems would you have in a year or a month, and are they varied? And can you give us any examples? Thank you. By, by, by behavioural, do you mean um, yeah. people breaching the code yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Okay. Um, by the time it, they get to us, as I say, we're a, an appeal cause rather than the main uh, cause. If I can use that analogy, so a lot of cases that that would have been challenged would have been dealt with, you know, inside the departments. We don't get a, a necessary sight to that. But when they come to us, I would say the vast majority of our civil service code cases start off as. HR cases in disguise, they're not really civil service cases, they're people you know, using the code as potentially part of an HR dispute. Once we've screened those out, um, we probably end up as, as commissioners hearing 10 a year, something like that. Um, uh, and most of those, are, you know, they, they, they're, they're often learnings, but no great problems. But one I can remember early in my time, to give you a sort of flavour of it, we're not talking here about people knocking around inside Downing Street. You know, the civil service, as you know, um, has very wide tentacles. And the particular case I have in my head was of a, a, a civil servant working in an abattoir for the Food Standards Agency, looking at um, the standard of, uh, of food in that particular abattoir. And he felt that there was uh, some manipulation of the data going on outside of his um, uh, office or his environment. Um, he challenged his own department. They didn't find in his favour. So he came to us. We took up the case. We investigated it, got the chief vet and all of that, and found that he was correct. Um, uh, it then turned out that the, while the data manipulation had been going on, it wasn't dangerous to human health, so we protected ourselves, protected from there, but it led to quite a big cultural change in that part of the, um, of the agency and, um, and the integrity of what that agency was doing was restored. So it starts a long way out sometimes, but very, very important issues. Yeah. There are not one of those happening every week or anything like that, 
but when they do, they're very important and need to be dealt with properly. Very good, very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for the evidence. It's greatly appreciated. Um, just in terms of your own role, there's probably two questions. I don't know whether you've had sight of the Audit Office report in terms of capacity and capability, which we're considering. Um, but if you have, um, you know, you know, in terms of the issues uh, from that, you know, what, what lessons can Northern Ireland learn from from GB or for, from England in terms of the changes required in this? And what do you think is the key things we need to be focused upon in the future ahead? Uh, well, I hesitate to uh, suggest you should learn anything um, from us, so I'll let you deduce that. But I, I think what I would say, so I joined the civil service back in 2004 after a private sector career. Um, and I'm one of those sort of curious people that's done both sides of the coin. Um, and uh, what I find, what I have found is that overwhelmingly the skill set of the civil service that we already have is massively undervalued. The people are utterly brilliant. They're usually very, very passionate about what they do. They have deep skills that lots and lots of the private sector would kill for. Um, and, 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 and so I think the first lesson is that the, the actual civil service that we have is often very undervalued. The second thing, however, is that I think the civil services, uh, are, they struggle to be representative of the society they serve. Um, and maybe that didn't matter as much in the past uh, as it does now, but I think it matters more today. And so I think unless you're at the civil service at, at all levels, and particularly starting at the top, reflects the society that it serves. I think it, it, it's on a sticky wicket. And, um, and, and so I, that's why I push the diversity card so hard. It isn't just because it, you know, it isn't a tick box thing at all. It's, a, it's about being good for the integrity and the pre presentation of public service. The third thing is I think there is a lot to be gained from the right sort of recruitment from the marketplace. Um, I think I contributed. I like to think I contributed as a, as a civil servant with my private sector background. I certainly learned a lot as well. Um, uh, and, um, and I can think of many colleagues uh, who, who are the same. And, you know, for example, the new national security advisor, Stephen Lovegrove, um, who you assume has spent all his entire life in in the security world actually was a was a, an investment guy who came into the civil service to look after the shareholdings of government and has then developed his skill set through different departments and ended up as the national security advisor so it, there are lots of good examples of people coming across and, and developing there are equally lots of good example bad examples of the opposite where people come in from the private sector with that sort of mindset of we know best you're a bunch of dullards in the civil service and we're here to tell you how to do it. Those people, they last a while, but they're dead people walking almost from the first five minutes, I would say, because the system is absolutely world-class at ignoring them. And, um, uh, and, and so I think, you know, there's a lesson both sides of that. When you get the right people in from the private sector, they can work well with the, uh, the, the uh, already here people and make the whole thing much better, you get the wrong sort of people in, then it's a waste of money and antibody re rejection occurs. They would be sort of some, some big conclusions, but uh, from my time. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned recruitment from the marketplace, and there's a quite high level of vacancy rate in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Uh, my colleague Matthew Tills referred to the age imbalance in terms of the workforce. Um, partially some of the reasons behind that uh, in terms of the vacancy has been cited as because of the pandemic. And I just wanted to see from your perspective how much that has hindered the recruitment of uh, workforce and how much that issue in terms of age imbalance also is a concern. Uh, I, I don't know your data enough to comment, but I, I don't haven't seen that as a massive problem for us. I, I said, I think that we've been, we've tried to be very flexible to enable surge recruitment when it's required. So, for example, uh, when the Chancellor a year ago sort of announced the first furlough scheme, um, uh, the HMRC or DWP, whichever bit of it uh, government was handling the furlough scheme, suddenly needed a surge of staff to be able to deal with it, and we enabled that. 
and the recruitment happened uh, relatively um, swiftly and easily. We, it, so the recruitment both happened and didn't we feel compromise our recruitment principles. Um, uh, there are occasional jobs where it gets very difficult to fill a role, um, usually at the top end, usually when it's either a very sp specialist role or it's not been thought through properly. But I've never found in my time, either as a civil servant or in the commission, a particular problem recruiting. And part of the reason for that is, I think, the system, long nothing to do with me, the system at large is very good at projecting uh, that if you really if you're really good at something there is nowhere better to to um to play your apply your wares than in uh, a civil service of a country like uh the uk slash db because of the scale and, and complexity of the challenge i used to do it as a background i worked for all sorts of companies retailers banks you know you know i worked for them nothing was ever as hard as it was in government and the reason was because government had scale you know, 60 million person databases instead of 6 million. Um, but it also had complexity. If a bank doesn't want to serve a group of the population, it, it, you know, it's too complex. It just doesn't bother. Um, mm. Government doesn't have that choice. So scale, complexity, and meaningful outcome are the things that we trade on when we're pitching jobs to the market. And, and the best people with the right motives are attracted to that and not by pay, which is obviously never going to be uh, a key card that we have to play. Yeah, that's very useful because our budget for next year, whilst it's largely flat for resource, there is an increase in terms of capital investment. Um, and then obviously there's also the COVID funding for the support schemes. And one of my concerns isn't just, and it's been an ongoing issue in terms of the having that resource and those skills to deliver that capital investment. Um, there was money handed back at the end of the last financial year. so. You know, there is a real need to fill those vacancies and to get that talent in. Um, the staff that are there at the moment are doing really valiant efforts and what they managed to turn around in very short time scales is really admirable. But I just think that it doesn't have the firepower in terms of resourcing to be able to do that. So it's interesting from your perspective that that's been an issue that hasn't been a, a massive concern, you know. so Well, I, I would argue, I mean, if this, this is something that, I could suggest to you that you you have a great opportunity to market yourself um, as a, as a great place to make a difference. I mean, you know, I I, I grew up in an era where you know Northern Ireland was a no go zone. Um, I went on holiday to 15 years ago and had one of the best holidays I've ever had, sort of touring the more mountains and up to sort of uh, you know Lan and across to Stranraer and the ferry and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it, it opens your eyes. I still think there's a lot of people who have a closed view of, mm. of, of life in, in Northern Ireland. Secondly, um, you're doing so many interesting things. Um, forget Brexit and all the noise around that. I mean, you, you've got you've got a scale. What are, is it? One point three million people or something? I don't know. Yeah. One point eight million people. You've got a. You've got a. You know, there's enough scale there to to, to be challenging. But more importantly, you can make a real difference quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I would I would be marketing yourself as a country to the sorts of skill sets that I'm talking about. And if you've got capital uh, unspent because you've got HR shortages, um, to me, I'd have thought there was a great opportunity to get people over there for a period of time from wherever, probably from the mainland, but maybe from elsewhere in the world, um, go and make a big difference quickly in a place that really matters. I think that would be a great message. Sure. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, once COVID's over, if you come back over again, I promise to buy you a pint. So that's the deal. So. That, would, that would be very kind. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Toole. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Ian, uh, for coming and giving evidence. Further to the last um, questioner, uh, what is, as a civil service commissioner based in Whitehall, what's your perception of the Northern Ireland civil service? What's my perception perception of it? Um, well, so when I was both, a, I, so I was a permanent secretary in the civil service in three different departments, and I've now done this role. And so I've always had the same view, I think, of the mix, which is um, it's a... Um, uh, it, it's a highly motivated, highly talented bunch of people um, serving uh, 
a community that's had its moment uh, and continues to do so, but it's always felt slightly hermetically sealed, if I can put it that way. Um, and that was why I was kind of making the pitch from the last time, you know, opening up your uh, your your borders, whether that's geographically or skill-wise, sector-wise. Um, and I think uh, the NICS is, is a great organization as it is, but I think it probably could do more to infuse uh, new skills from outside um, and, and, and become more diverse in all its meanings of that word. I don't mean more, you know, just the personal characteristics. I mean, more skills from the private sector, more people from outside of Northern Ireland going to work there, that kind of thing. That's what I've always thought. So I've never thought it's a problem-ridden organization. I just think it's a bit closed, a bit hermetically sealed. And if it could open up, it would be even better, would be my summary. I think that is a fair... Um... Uh, I don't think many people would argue with that. Certainly, we wouldn't have an, having um, gone through it. Just on the one uh, thing that's emerged about in a, an audit office report here, a Northern Ireland audit office report, is and subsequent testimony we've had is around a belief among some that uh, the civil service commissioners in London, i.e., yourself, are have more of a strategic HR function when it comes to uh, permanent secretary recruitment and you yourself have said that you sit on all permanent secretary boards and what we have heard is that uh, in relative terms you will take not you personally but you including you but your organization will take more of a front-footed approach to um, consulting with the department about the kinds of leadership and uh, needs they have um, is that a particular is that something that uh, is in, I'm not sure that that's in CRAG, is that specifically in your in the legislation or is that an informal role that you've accrued to yourself? Okay, uh, very good question. I uh, hope not to take too long on it because there's a lot in that. Um, so first of all, don't think it is officially in CRAG that says we should do permanent secretary recruitment, for example. Um, that is, a, it is if they were bringing them in from outside. If it was an open competition, then we would we would do it. But if it's if it's coming from within the system. But uh, the commission has a sort of MOU agreement with the cabinet office to chair all the panels on behalf of the prime minister for permanent secretary uh, posts. And uh, everybody, I think, believes it works well. Um, what uh, I te- what, So what I do is I sit on something called the Senior Leadership Committee, which is the, uh, for want of a better word, is the talent management group within the civil service in, in the um, uh, in GB. Uh, it, it, it's usually chaired by uh, either the cabinet secretary or in this case the head of the treasury, so Tom Scholar chairs it, has most of the senior permanent secretaries around Whitehall on it um, and I represent the commission on it and we on a regular basis do talent management, pipeline management of people coming through uh, the ranks to try and see you know when people are coming up for uh, whether they're ready for permanent secretary, there are lots of schemes to try and train them up, et cetera, et cetera. So we have quite a long look at the pipeline um, and start to see the talent coming through the system. When an individual uh, vacancy occurs, so let's take my current one, which is the MOD. Um, the MOD vacancy occurred because Stephen Lovegrove, who I mentioned earlier, had, has been appointed by the Prime Minister to National Security Advisor. So his role is now... Uh, uh, vacant. The first thing uh, we do is uh, work very closely with the civil service HR function, who have a special group who deal with the senior leadership. Um, a job description is agreed with the with the uh, MOD. Um, I then ring the Secretary of State. So I had the call a couple of weeks ago with the Secretary of State for Defence to get his assessment of what's really important in that role. Um, we weave that into uh, into the uh, job requirements. Um, we also have a conversation about are we advertising openly or not? Uh, sometimes it's to the whole market, the whole world market. Sometimes it's a white hole only. In this place, in this particular case, it's a sort of white hole and securocrat um, uh, group that we're going for for the obvious reasons of the role. Um, then uh, I chair the panel, so I uh, decide what the panel is that's going to be 
um, overseeing that rec recruitment. Uh, there's nearly always a senior person from the centre, in this case, uh, Tom Sculler from uh, the Treasury. Uh, I then have two non-exec directors that I've asked to sit on it from, uh, from the MOD board. And I have an external person who, is, who knows about the security world but isn't from, directly from Whitehall. So we have a panel of five. Um, we then advertise the job across the civil service uh, job site. We have, I forget how many people we had apply, but we'll say it was a dozen. It was some number in that, sh that area. As a panel, we then shortlisted to four. Um, and now those four are in the final uh, throws of this and they meet, they're meeting the Secretary of State uh, with one of my staff in attendance to understand for a sort of fireside chat. We have mm -hmm. a psychological assessment. We're doing a staff engagement exercise. Um, and then we will have a final interview process, um, uh, which happens to be next Tuesday, I believe. Um, and then as a panel, we will recommend to the Prime Minister any and all candidates who are appointable uh, uh, with all the strengths and weaknesses and so on, and then it becomes a PM decision. So that's how it goes from a long way out to an actual decision, and I feel actively involved throughout that process. It, so that's really interesting in terms of the the, the strategic bit at the, the, the front end, and you're, so you, you talk about the, the kind of talent management being involved in, talent, in the talent management pipeline, the MOU with the capital office sitting on senior leadership group. In, presumably in those senior leadership conversations, permanent secretaries are saying, um, maybe maybe they're not, maybe it's not as naked as this, but they're not, I don't mean it, there's anything inappropriate about it, but they are saying there's a director general, uh, you know, th this is my recently appointed d director general here who's very, you're, you're talking about people, the, the, the people who are in their 30s and 40s and whatever, who are kind of the permanent secretary of five or 10 years time. is That's what the conversation is, I presume. Yeah, primarily. I mean, so for example, I think there are 160, 180 director generals in the, in the GB civil service. All of those will be mapped onto a grid of, yeah. of, 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 of you know, talent, uh, both performance and potential. So I've got, if I may, I've just got two, two further questions. And thank you. So the next question is, do you see any potential tension between the kind of front-footed strategic role of talent management, getting thinking about directors and direct, and obviously this goes down the chain. This will this goes down to people at SEO and grade seven level who are being talent managed into middle management and then the SES. But do you see a tension between that strategic role and your role as a uh, guardian of the merit principle? Is there a tension there that has to be managed? I suppose um, I, I haven't found it to be, and the reason the reason is because the talent management system is taken across. You know, you look at a candidate and you say a person rather than a candidate, and you say, you know, what are their core skills? Well, okay, they might be very good at big operational type stuff. So you immediately say, well, they could be good for DWP or they could be good for HMRC or one of the big departments. Mm -hmm. Somebody else might be a very good um, policy, economic policy type, in which case you might say, you know, they'd be good for transport or they'd be good for bays or something. So as a group, what we're trying to do is look at people and say, this is most likely where their long-term career is going to be. Um, and then that enables the civil service to then put the right training and, um, uh, 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 and mentoring in place to develop them. When we actually get to a specific competition, it's open to any and all people to apply. Um, we take it on, on the merits of the application and not, not on any sort of previous but, version of the world. But, so I, I mean, personally, I think that's, that makes sense, but, but it is true to say that the strategic forward-looking kind of talent management bit is that's based on an MOU and custom and best practice that you developed rather than the legislative basis of the, which is crag, crag and then everything going back to North Coast Trevelyan, which is the fundamentals. Um, can I just ask one final question, if I may share? It's on something, I don't know if you're aware, Ian, about something uh, a practice in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which is the, uh, around talent management, that uh, when it comes to appraisal, um, we only have two boxes, or there are only two boxes in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which which are 
satisfactory and unsatisfactory, does that seem to, if you were to place that system in one of two boxes, would you put it in satisfactory or unsatisfactory? I'm just thinking of the clash song, should I stay or should I go? Um, the, um, uh, I, I, I don't want to criticize other people's HR systems, but I've never thought two boxes would be enough. I also don't think uh, five, four, five, six box systems work either because in the end, most HR systems, in my experience, public or private, end up with three boxes. You have the one, the top box for the really good people, uh, the second box for the mass of people who you want to keep and who you want to develop and you want to reward, and then a, a third box for a very small number of people who you want to performance improve. Um, and I, I've always thought that's the right system for HR, but I don't know enough about yours to comment further. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for your role, Dean. Ian, you're very welcome here today. And uh, I'm glad that your last experience here in Ireland in holidays was good uh, at that time. So hopefully we'll see you coming back again too in the future. Uh, Ian, and thank you for your presentation. And I was a wee bit surprised to know you had mentioned uh, Trevelyan uh, establishing the civil service in terms of openness and fairness and uh, and on merit. Mind you, Trevelyan's reputation here in Ireland in the 1850s was a whole lot different. <laughs> but notwithstanding that, um, uh, the, the one area that I was particularly interested in, you had said that you had taken uh, pride in the uh, Life Chances Program. Mm -hmm. and, and you also made the comment, you see, that the civil service itself should be re uh, reflective of the community that it serves. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a lot of people who fall into these categories uh, when you talk about ex-prisoners, multi-veterans, and uh, care leavers, um, and, uh, and and I'm not aware of maybe a life chances program existing here in the north of Ireland, but uh, if it isn't in existence, uh, and I'm to be corrected on that, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, how did you go about actually establishing that in itself and ensuring that uh, that type of um, uh, initiative uh, was developed? Okay, um, so it was a kind of the usual chance uh, sort of coalition of three things going on at the same time. One was we had a minister in the cabinet office who uh, was, was interested in this from a political point of view. He wanted to see, um, uh, the, because there's, there's all, I think you'll, you'll often find in government, you'll often find it yourself, that um, when politicians come up with policy agendas, one of the levers they try to pull is their own backyard, whether it's their own department or their own procurement budget or whatever it is. Um, and sometimes that can be burdensome. So when, when a government is saying we want to reduce reoffending from prisons, you know, one of the questions is, well, what are you doing about taking people into your employment? Um, so we happened to have a minister who was very keen on, on this, uh, Ben Gummer at the time when I started. Um, secondly, you had a civil service leadership who similarly were minded. Um, and thirdly, a commission that felt uh, it was part of our brief to develop the way in which the civil service would recruit to, to broaden our reach and become more open and meritocratic. Um, we then put the idea into practice. Then it got really hard. Um, uh, as I've said to people on many occasions, the difference in recruiting Norton 1 person of, from this background is the same as recruiting between one and a hundred. So the first time we tried to recruit an ex-offender into the civil service, we had every roadblock under the sun come out. And, you know, and it was like whack-a-mole, you whack one down and another one would come up. Um, and it took about a year from agreeing that this was a good thing to do to getting the first person in through the through the door or out to the door in, in one case and in our door um, and, uh, and 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 fortunately the two first two recruits turned out to be really really good people as well so that that word spread and all of a sudden it became an okay thing to do and so ever since then we've we've grown and as i say i think we've just now cumulatively reached a um, hundred um, I had a similar experience 10 years previously to that in my civil service job with apprenticeships. I had policy responsibility for apprenticeships. 
Um, uh, John Denham was my Secretary of State. We went around the department together and found we had no apprentices in the department. We said, I said, I'll recruit one for my office and one for your office, John. Um, it was an absolute nightmare how to do it. But once we'd done it, it you know, we, we set a trend and the two became five, five became 10, and now they do thousands of apprentices in, in the civil service every year. So it, it, it's, it's, it's quite easy. If you, need a, you need a coalition of interest to start something like that, but then you real, need real persistence and patience. Uh, naught to one, one to ten, ten to a hundred, and then and then and then it becomes mainstream, and then you can move on to the next category. That would be my learnings from it. Yeah, well, you are to be congratulated. I think it's a wonderful initiative. Uh, so very well done, and uh, reflect that persistence. I think that we all know that too. And most things that are worthwhile, that requires that kind of persistent determination, very often by someone at the helm to make sure that it happens, and hopefully maybe that that's something that we can examine. Uh, it's possibilities here at home as well too. So thank you, yeah. Good, thank you. Right. Mr. Beggs. Again, Annie, and thanks for uh, coming before us and giving us of your experience. Um, you've indicated that the uh, civil service that you produce your uh, good practice guys is over 400,000 and then there's 40,000 new recruits each year. Um, can you... Think of any reason why the good practice guides that are applicable in England, Scotland and Wales should not be applicable in Northern Ireland? Um, I'm, I, I would imagine, uh, I mean, Deirdre and I speak often and, um, you know, we, 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 we see the world through the same pair of eyes in lots of ways. Um, and uh, I would ask her to, to maybe make the answer to that. But my assumption would be that the principles in our recruitment principles could and should apply to you. The practicalities may need a bit of local tweaking to fit your own environment. Um, you know, the, 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 the political class in Northern Ireland is, is in a different system to the political class in, in Whitehall, et cetera, or Westminster. So you just might need to do some tweaking um, uh, but the principles, I think, should be the same, really, I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, and then I understand that Northern Civil Service can slide across to the uh, National UK Civil Service. Is, is that correct? Uh, well, can people in the, in the NICS uh, apply to join, apply for jobs in the UK Civil Service? I think that's right. I, think we, I, I don't think we treat civil servants in NICS as a sort of like a third party. Um, so I think they're open to apply to Whitehall only, comp what we call Whitehall only competitions. Um, but uh, if I've got that wrong, I'll check for you afterwards and let you know. But but I understand that you know if, if someone was working in the national civil service wanting to come back home here, perhaps I had an elderly parent that they that they would face difficulties. Um, um, uh, do 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 you ever hear of that? I haven't had that one raised to me. Sorry. Okay. Um, in the course of the audit office report, we've learnt of um, high levels of agency workers, vacancies. Um, over 300 people had uh, been given temporary promotions for over a year. Huge problems, as far as I can see. Um, and this is managed by our commissioners, the Northern Ireland uh, Board of the Civil Service and the Permanent Aid Secretaries. Who would be held accountable for such poor outcomes in GB? Because nobody seems to be accountable here. Um, well, it's a good uh, question. I, uh, it wouldn't be most of the problems or issues that you've raised there would not be civil service commissioner issues. I mean, unless unless people were using their contractual position to try and bring people in from the outside because they, they didn't want to put them through the recruitment loops and we could challenge on that basis. But is it a good idea to have large numbers of vacancies filled by contractors and all that sort of stuff? I mean, obviously not managerially. Um, and in the uh, equivalent job when I was Perm Sec at the Cabinet Office, um, a lot of those issues would end up on my desk and the minister that I was working with at the time, Francis Maud, would regard himself as responsible as well, um, uh, even if most of the issues were being actually played out in other departments. 
um, and, um, and and that's where we would, uh, but we would regard it as our, and certainly the politicians in Westminster would regard it as our problem because I'd be summoned to the PAC or equivalent in, um, in, in Westminster and, and, and hold over the coal. So I, I think it's seen as a cabinet office leadership role in Westminster and Whitehall. Okay. Is my but, thank you. Um, and then you've also indicated that uh, you would be involved in about 150, 200 uh, uh, recruitments uh, a year, uh, primarily principal uh, permanent secondaries and, and various director levels. So we've been advised that our um, uh, commissioners involved in anything grade five and above. H how does that compare with yourself? I, I'm not quite sure where grade five is in terms of your, your own comparison. Okay, grade five would be below the level. Um, so we, we as commissioners would not directly, we're responsible for the system of recruitment of everybody, the most junior grade up. But in terms of chairing recruitment panels, we would not do that at grade five level. We would do that at what used to be called grade three level and above. So and how many grades are there between grade five and grade three? Is there, is there in, others? In, 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 uh, the modern civil service is four grades of what they call senior civil service, permanent secretary, director general, director, and deputy director. And the deputy director maps onto your grade five, and director, I think, maps onto your grade three, if, if you still operate that, and director general to grade two, and permanent secretary to grade one. Okay, that's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask, um, Ian, in terms of the uh, you and your colleagues uh, as commissioners in, in Great Britain, how are you recruited and appointed? Is How are we recruit? Yeah. Appointed? Yeah. Well, in my particular case, um, through a sort of grand national course of uh, obstacles, I would say. So um, it started uh, as an open uh, public appointment recruitment. So I applied like anybody else. I was interviewed, shortlisted and interviewed by a panel that was chaired by the cabinet secretary of the day. Um, and, uh, and the head of the Treasury of the day and an independent. Um, they then came forward with a, uh, I think it was a two-person shortlist, might have been three. Uh, we then went before David Cameron uh, uh, individually, and I was interviewed by David Cameron, and he decided I would be the person to do that. Um, but he said, I can't do that until after Brexit, after the referendum. Um, he obviously then... Um, uh, it didn't survive the referendum, so I assumed that my life in this job had ended. But then I was re-interviewed by Theresa May for it. Um, and when she put me forward, I then had to be cleared by the opposition parties. That would be, uh, in, in, in those days, it was Labour, Lib Dem and UKIP on the highest voting levels of the previous election. Um, I then had to be cleared by the devolves, both Scotland and Wales. Uh, I then had to go in front of a public accounts, uh, uh, a public administration select committee peace scrutiny hearing, chaired by Bernard Jenkins, but multi-party. Um, and once I got through all that, I then had to be put for the palace, and the palace then recommended. So it was a hugely long, drawn-out process that took over a year, slightly complicated by the Brexit referendum. And it's a two, it's a two-day-a-week job. So I've often joked it was, you know, one prime minister for each day. Um, but it was it was a heavy process, uh, and rightly so, because it's an important uh, it's important to get somebody who is genuinely supported by the system and also by the uh, opposition to that to the current government, because otherwise it looks uh, it could easily be a crony uh, type appointment. Um, for my commissioners, and there's a, there's a minimum number that has to exist. I think it's seven. I can't remember if that includes me or not. I think it includes me. It has to be seven, so six others. But we flex the number according to the volume of work, and I've been operating with 11 others um, for the last period. There are sorry, 10 others, 11 including me. And um, we run those same appointments as an open appointment, but this time I chair the panels with, with a senior official of the cabinet office uh, and some independents and then we recommend the commissioners to uh, the prime minister who then just puts them straight to the palace and the palace then appoints um, if there was an attempt by the government to force commissioners 
onto the commission um, that for what it, for whatever reason, and it's only never happened in practice, but it's an if. Then, as the first commissioner, I have an option to say no, so I can I can whatever the right word is, but blackball somebody um, if I feel that, that they're being forced upon the commission and they're not going to be the right person for the job. I can't force somebody into the commission, but I can block them. When you say that um, you're normally one of seven, but you've been operating with 11, you plus, I think, 11, have you the power then to co-opt, or does your commission have a power to co-opt people? No, 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 no because uh, the seven is the legal minimum. The, the commission doesn't isn't deemed to exist properly under the law if it doesn't have seven commissioners. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, because of the volume of work, um, we judged 11 slash 12 was the right number of people. Um, and I've also tried to have it coming in in two groups of roughly five or six so that one group comes in as a group, gets experience, it develops. And everybody, sorry, I should have said everybody is on a fixed five-year term, cannot be extended beyond the five years, can leave obviously if they want to. Um, very difficult to force a commissioner out as well. It has to be real, you know, criminal behavior or whatever before you can be forced out. So once you're in, you're in for, for that five years, no more, no less. And um, uh, and so I've tried to have cohort A come in, work together as a group, then cohort B come in two to three years later and then repeat so that you've always got a mixture Continuing, of experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned some some 100 offenders or re-offenders who have been brought into the civil service and imper- the imperial civil service. In what category are these offenders? Um, well, I don't know the, the answer to all of them, but I know yeah. the first two. One one was a a, a, a drug dealer from Liverpool, um, uh, who, as you can quite imagine, was quite good at lots of skills. Just wrongly applied them for want of a better word um, and, um, and 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 got his life sorted out and, um, and and you know had logistics and commercial and leadership and all those other skills um, then we will have uh, you know people from a range of, 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 of uh, backgrounds but to be honest that's privacy stuff yeah, that, that I wouldn't get into yeah. um, there are there are risk assessments, so it would be unlikely to be taking. But I think I think on on that on that issue, your, your comment earlier about being supported by the system is important because obviously there are particular difficulties in Northern Ireland uh, in terms of people and and, and, and criminality and, and organised criminality and so on that we have yeah. to take into consideration. And it would be risk assessed by the justice system. Um, you know the prison governors, the the people in MOJ, and so on. So it isn't it isn't our decision to sort of just yank somebody in. But what we did was we changed the rules to enable the system to appoint them, and also to encourage people to apply. Um, and that uh, matching the supply and demand, because uh, these people would never have thought of the career in the civil service, and if they had, they'd have been knocked off at the first hurdle before. Yeah. And, and so it was. It was really just, you know, a bit of a matchmaking exercise, if you like. Okay, um, that's good. I'm not aware of any other member who has any other questions at this stage. So, can I thank you very much um, for your attendance this afternoon uh, and for your, your your input and giving us an insight into the commission that operates uh, with the Imperial Civil Service uh, across the water. And uh, thank you very much uh, for. Uh, your expertise and your candour. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time, all of you, and I hope you have a, a, a good conclusion to this. I, I love my time in Northern Ireland, uh, not just on holiday, come back quite regularly. Yes, yeah, um, and, and we, it, is a requ- it is a requirement when you come to Northern Ireland on holiday that you go away and be a persuader for people to come on holiday to Northern Ireland. So we just don't want you to come back. We want you to... Um, we want you to come back uh, and make your make your uh, friends aware that this is a good place to holiday as well. And, and I, I know do. you're I know you're keen on cricket, and we have some very good, lovely, picturesque cricket grounds. So you you'd be very welcome to come here. Uh, Mr. Hildage and I are both vice presidents of cricket clubs, so um, be, be aware that cricket in Northern Ireland is a huge sport. I, I am aware, and um, I've just returned from India, so um, uh, where I've done more quarantining. 
than I ever care. I, did, I think the ratio of quarantine to test match days is about five to one. So, um, <laughs> uh, so I'm looking forward to some so good you, recreation. It's starting as if you spent spent more time in quarantine than some of the English batsmen spent at the wicket, unfortunately. But there you go. <laughs> one, of, one of the one of the Times journalists did tweet that to me. Did it? All right. Said, okay. She said she said I was more on I was on telly more than the England batsmen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Luke, th thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, members, we seem to have lost uh, contact with those who were joining us remotely. No, we There's... still have them, but we, we, we can't tell from the screen who wants to right. ask a question. We'll see, okay. We still have them. Okay, members, um, th those who uh, are joining us remotely are with us. Hello. I'm not sure whether they can hear us. Oh, uh, I can hear you. They can? Yeah, okay. Can they Okay, um, so um, yes. Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Stevenson, um, have you any comments that you would like to make, Mr. Donnelly? Uh, not at this point. Sure. Okay, um, Mr. Stevenson, have you any comments you want to make? No specific comments, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, then, Mr. Can I say to Brad, broadcasting that Mr. Watmore and Mr. Stevenson can now leave the meeting. Uh, members, we will move into closed session to discuss the evidence session. Uh, from the Civil Service Commissioners regarding our inquiry into capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Um, broadcasting, um, can you bring in uh, Ms Christina Burns, uh, Auditor, and Mr Connor McGune. Mr Kyle Bingham is already in the meeting, and we continue to be joined by uh, Mr Donnelly and Mr Allen in the room. Um, Ms Burns, Mr McGune, can you uh, hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Mr. McGill. Yes, Chair, I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you also. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so at this stage then we'll go into closed session. Committee room 30.